You don't have to do anything crazy. Just move for 20 minutes a day. That's it? Well, that, that's step one. By fasting from crappy foods, you actually have more control of who you are. What are the, what are the things people are doing every day that mess them up, that decrease their energy, that affect their ability to function, think, and be? The first one is, why is it that people are willing to spend an hour a day in a spin class, which is probably creating overtraining anyway, um, but they're not willing to skip breakfast sometimes? I think skipping breakfast is, is easier and it's okay to do both. Uh, it's just from a, a return on investment thing that it's the most important thing that, that I could think of. Even if you're not committed to changing your diet, even if you're going to eat all the things that you and I know are not real food, fasting can still help. It's just a lot easier and it helps more if you eat the right way. And one of the things that's really behind fasting, Mark, is the idea that fasting is just going without. And in the book, I talk about, okay, let's think through what happens emotionally when you say you're going to go without something. We have other kinds of fasting that you probably haven't thought of. The keto diet is fasting from carbs. The vegan diet is fasting from animals. I don't know why you'd want to do that if you want to live healthy for a long time, but maybe for a couple of weeks to turn on. That's another podcast. <laughs> exactly. But, and hey, go pegan. There you go. The, uh, uh, the the thing that's also happening, you fast from substances, that's called, you know, addiction or sobriety, you know, addiction treatment or sobriety. And we have fasting from people, it's called solitude. And we have mm -hmm. fasting from the, the, at the end of the book, I actually tell people, try fasting from hate, right? I also talk about mm -hmm. fasting from sex or at least porn for a brief period of time, because your body feels like you're, you're going to die if you don't have sex frequently. You're not going to die if you don't have sex for a couple of weeks. You're not going to die if you don't have food for a month, but you feel like you're going to die if you don't have food for a brief period. We're talking about skipping breakfast, but the body's like, no. So that's the thing. How do you create a sense of safety when you're going without something that you think you need, that you feel like you need, but you know you don't need? And just by doing that for brief periods of time, it's just like lifting weights. It's just like exercise, but it's exercise for your emotional body. It's exercise for your spiritual body. It's exercise mm. for your physical body, including those subcellular things that you just talked about. And when we change our mindset to fasting as just exercise, we can do exercise, right? And you might feel like you're going to die on the treadmill, but you know, you won't and you do it anyway every day. So it, we're just going to normalize fasting. <laughs> And also acknowledge, Mark, there are it's people It's a lot less eating. painful than my workouts, my trainer. That's like, I don't know, that's my, like, no more reps, please. Yeah. He makes me and, do, he makes me do push-ups with bands. You know, you put like a- Oh, band, that's so cool. Band. I love bands. You know, like, I'm like, holy cow. Well, I mean, you are looking a little bit bigger in the shoulders there. So all that Tom Brady stuff seems like it's working. Yes, it is. It, there was something else. I know I'm not exactly answering your question, but you mentioned Tom Brady. The other part of his longevity, he figured out, like I did, that nightshades, um, the lectin problem with nightshades, for me, but not for everyone, for about a third of people. Man, those mm -hmm. things cause cravings like no one's business. If you give me nightshades mm -hmm. like potatoes or a, a, a bell plant, <laughs> bell plants, <laughs> bell peppers or eggplants, man, I want to eat sugar like no one's business, right? So you got to find the foods that don't trigger can things. can you give up tomatoes? I, I just can't give up tomatoes. It's yeah, like, I'll still eat some fresh tomatoes. I just take out the seeds oh, and you peel them. And, oh, and this is, oh. it, it was it's a core a part of- tomato off the vine yeah. in the garden in a hot August summer day. This well, you like have a garden, Mark. Life experience. <laughs> but I live in an organic farm, and, and that, that's something that, that I also would encourage people to fast from junk food and industrial meat and things like that. Mm. Um, now, there's I'm a fast I can get behind. That. Fast yeah. from industrial it, food. I love that. It, it, it's a real type of fast. You say, look, I'm going to go without, because there are people, in fact, a great many people listening right now, they're going, you mean I, I can't have Skittles? I can't have Reese's peanut butter cups? I can't have Cheetos or whatever the thing is? Well, you can have them. I'm telling you that fast from them because your body feels like you're going to die if you don't have those. And the side effect of a fast like that, Mark, is, as you all know, it builds soil. And we have pigs, sheep, turkeys, chickens, and a great number of vegetables growing on my organic farm. I feed my local community, and I am building soil like no one's business. We recovered a five-acre gravel pit using animal manure and turned it back into fertile soil, and we're restoring the forest on a part of the property. Wow. When you choose to do that kind of a fast, you can still eat, but you're giving back to the planet. And the, the work you've been doing lately on food policy and all that stuff, that is also a part of the fasting world. You are choosing to go without the things that make you weak. 
even though there's a part of your body that wants you to eat those and you are becoming master of that part of your body. And when you're master of that part of the body, the side effect is you're nicer to everyone around you because you're eating better food. <laughs> like everybody mm. wins when you do this. It's so oh, important. Wait, 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 wait. I don't want to just pass by that. You just said something that's highly profound because in the middle of this incredibly divisive world, I mean, I was born 60 years ago and yeah, there were Democrats and Republicans and there were certainly divisions in society and there was segregationists and there was hate. And, but the level of divisiveness, the level of reactivity, the, the level of hatred. I mean, I post a picture of me with uh, now President-elect Biden talking about how we can start to build bridges and have conversations and we don't have to agree. We can, you know, have deep conversations, even if we don't have the same worldview without hating each other. And I mean, and there was just the most incredible blowback that I just could not believe. And all this projection of hatred on me and saying I was for vaccine mandates and mask, I mean, mask mandates, <laughs> stuff I never even, I was just talking about love and let's, let's all be friends <laughs> and let's, let's disagree, but let's disagree nicely. Let's yeah. not vilify and hate. And I was like, whoa. And, and, and what really is clear and David Perlmutter's work and his son, Austin, and in their latest book, Brainwash, really talked about this, yeah. that our diet, our modern industrial diet has literally hijacked our brain and activated the amygdala, which is the fight or flight, attack, defend, victim part of our brain. Absolutely. And so we are operating in a highly activated way in which our frontal lobe becomes disconnected from our amygdala, our oh, frontal lobe so is the adult in the room. It's our executive functioning. It's the one who doesn't do the stupid thing, even though he thinks about doing it, right? Well, <laughs> Instead, it's like Dennis the Menace. And when I when I think about what I'm uh, not doing, what I'm going to do, I've already done it. You know, <laughs> like, and I think, yeah, I think this is such an important thing you said that it changes the quality of our behavior, our emotions, our relationships, our fear, our anger, our hostility. These are things that are killing us society now. And I, I just, it just breaks my heart. It, me too. I, I interviewed Dr. Vivek Murthy, former U.S. Surgeon General. He wrote a book saying in his time as Surgeon General, the number one epidemic that he came across that was causing the most problem wasn't viral at all. It was connectedness. He said, we have a, a profound state of loneliness and disconnection in people, and that's what's making us sick and we have to fix it. So then a week after he comes out on the podcast, he gets named by Biden to Biden's to co-chair his coronavirus task force. This is a guy who values co connection and connectivity and will value those things so that our policies might say it's kind of important. We don't turn on that epidemic when we're trying to turn off another one. That's so. Right. But and, and, OK, that's it. And I said, hey, congratulations. We got a guy who cares about what we care about on a panel. And man, the amount of people saying exactly what you heard, just projecting all this hate. Here's what's going on, Mark, to take it back to fasting. Okay. If you don't have a healthy metabolism, your blood sugar can crash. And if you do something like eat MSG, which as you well know, as you've written about, is hidden in so many foods under fake names. And when you eat MSG, it causes hypoglycemia. When your blood sugar gets really low, your body says, oh, this is kind of an emergency. I need some blood sugar. Good thing I have built-in systems to turn on blood sugar instantly. It's called cortisol and adrenaline. So your body says, I'm crashing. Let me get you some stress hormones right here. And then you get your energy back, but it's fighting energy. It's stress energy. And then you see someone post about, hey, could we have more connection and empathy and kindness? And they're like, you're a bad man. Well, there's a connection directly <laughs> to food. There really is. Yes, and there really is. By fasting, you train your body to do that. And by fasting from crappy foods, you actually have more control of who you are. And you can show up as the person that you want to be instead of the person you are when you're hungry. Because I don't know about you, but hypoglybitchy is a very real word for me. <laughs> at least it used to be. Yeah. That, that, what is that? ICD-9, go to CD-10 code 1034.2. Is that it? <laughs> it's a clear medical diagnosis. Hypoglybitchy. I've never heard that. <laughs> That's very funny. No, you you sort of we're sort of kind of skirting around the edges of this, but it, but in your book you talk about how fasting can be a powerful entry point into honesty and and control of ourselves. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, there's two kinds of fast. There's fasting for health, 
and you can do this intermittent fast with the hacks you do it during the week. And there's another kind of fast, which I call a spiritual fast. And these tend to be for at least 24 hours, a little bit longer, where you actually sit with what's going on in, in your feelings, you journal. So what I'm doing for people who order fast this way and send me the receipt at fastthisway.com, I'm taking them through a two week, I'm, I'm calling it a fasting challenge, but it's really a fasting course where as an author, I feel like I haven't done my full job because I'm also a teacher. I taught at the University of California for five years. So I'm actually teaching people what's in the book for two weeks. And we're going to all together, thousands of people at the same time, practice intermittent fasting with the hacks, without the hacks. But for the last two days of this two-week challenge, we're going to do a spiritual fast. I'm actually going to get you a fasting journal and you're going to be able to sit there and say, all right, I'm actually going to go for 24, 36, even 48 hours without food, but I'm going to do it mindfully. I'm going to reduce distractions in my life and I'm going to be hungry. And I'm going to say, wow, how many times am I actually thinking about food? Do I really want to snap at my kids or am I getting even more angry at the news that I shouldn't be watching during a spiritual fast anyway? All of those things so we can gain awareness of ourselves. And the cool thing is because you're fasting, you have extra ketones present and you have more energy to think about it. And this is why all the great spiritual traditions include fasting because that little boost to the neurons is a boost that you can use for self-awareness. And mm. that's why fasting is so powerful. It puts you back in charge of you instead of letting these automated life systems like, is that, is that scary? Take my attention. Is that food? Take my attention. Is that a nice pair of legs? Take my attention, right? You're supposed to own all of that and you can own all of that. And it doesn't have to be painful to get there. And the reason most of us haven't taken on fasting and the reason it terrified me, in fact, I was offended when someone told me I should fast when I weighed 300 pounds because I'm like, I would die. It would be terrible. All of that fear, it's not real. It, the fear is real, but the reality is very different. And the more we can help ourselves live in reality, the more control we have of our energy, that energy goes to the prefrontal cortex, which allows us to catch those negative thoughts before they turn into negative behavior. And the challenge in the book at the end is, look, just spend two hours fasting from hate. Maybe spend a whole day where you don't say one hateful thing, you don't think one hateful thing. And that is really challenging. I took electrodes up to my head and spent time meditating, a lot of time meditating to, to get to that point where I can do that. And even then you'll see these things sneak in, but just a regular short practice of that allows you to remember the kind of person that you're capable of being instead of the kind of person you are when you're constantly triggered by industrial foods, by industrial news sources, <laughs> and basically by a world that really isn't set up to let you be who you're supposed to be. This last book, Headstrong, was about the mitochondria, which seems like an esoteric thing. It seems like a complicated word, but you sort of explained that there are these little bacteria-like organelles inside our cells, and there's hundreds to thousands and tens of thousands in some cells, and they basically take food that you eat, and they take oxygen that you breathe, and they turn it into energy that runs every system in your body, and there's byproducts. There's water and that you pee out and carbon dioxide that you breathe out. And then there's waste products that your body has to deal with. And that whole process is at the center of everything that matters in terms of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All these things are related, to, even autism yes. uh, are related to <laughs> mitochondrial dysfunction. And there's a woman, Suzanne Goes, an extraordinary scientist from Harvard, Oxford, pediatric neurologist who's discovered on the autistic brains that the mitochondria aren't working well. There's no energy in these kids' brains. And yep. so they gave them mitochondrial stuff, support, and these kids get better. You, you may not know this, but uh, I met the clinical definition of Asperger's syndrome until my early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's brain mitochondria. You don't make enough energy, you don't have enough energy to filter out all the noise from the world around you. And of course, you're not going to make social skills. That's less important than just being able to know what's going on. And what I'm finding in the research in Headstrong shows 48% of people under age 40 have early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. It means you take a unit of food and a unit of air and you get less than a unit of energy. Mm -hmm. And everyone over age 40 has mitochondrial dysfunction. They call it aging. I think it's still early onset. Our mitochondria don't have to decline with time and it comes from poor management. And if you think about it, if they really are ancient bacteria, which we're, we're sure they are, then what you have is you have a gut biome, all these bacteria in your gut, and you have another network of bacteria that's trying to run your system, that's an integral part of your system. And if you treat that, 
as carefully as you treat the gut and your bacteria, or frankly, you treat your compost pile so that it makes good soil. It's all the same activity. Mm -hmm. And bacteria actually do think they have not real brains, but they have a process. They have an algorithm for staying alive. If you make them happy and you tell them only the strong survive and you do the things that you would do to maintain any biome like that, you can actually have way more energy than really Mother Nature intended. I, I think we can do that. And that's, that's what I want to dig in. And I just, just want to sort of share this story that I heard the other day about the role of mitochondrial therapy in treating ALS. Now, you might yes. not have heard this study, but the mitochondria require certain nutrients and certain factors. Uh, one of them is called NAD, uh, and we're going to talk about that. And this is taken as a supplement. It also has some resveratrol, which is from red wine, also is a mitochondrial regulator. And it controls these master genes that affect inflammation, that affect oxidative stress, that help produce more energy. And there was a preliminary study done. Now, there's been many, many drugs studied for ALS. None of them work. Yep. Even the best, best, best one that got approved reduces the decline by about 15%, but you still decline. They did an interventional trial using NAD and resveratrol, which actually stopped and actually improved patients with ALS. And they regained function, which yeah. is something that's completely out of the medical paradigm. That just doesn't happen. And, and it's one of 10 different mitochondrial stimulation strategies, all of which will help ALS. Right. So what are the things that like nuke your mitochondria? What are, the, what are the things people are doing every day that mess them up, that decrease their energy, that affect their ability to function, think, and be? The first one is eating damaged fats or bad fats. And we hear about this thing called a cellular membrane, but it's not really a membrane. It's a, a collection of tiny droplets of fat and your mitochondria have their own little bag of fat that they're held in. It's and like a baggie that holds all yeah. the contents in your cell. It's made up of fat. Correct. And then there's another one that holds the cell itself. So if you eat the wrong fats, particularly fried foods, even if you fry them in you know, coconut oil or butter, it's still not good to fry because the heat damages oils. Then your body gets these oils and it goes, what do I do with these? I'm going to try and build mitochondria that are supposed to take energy and or take food and air and make energy, but they can't do it because their membrane isn't flexible enough. It gets damaged. So I call them FLFs, FLF. funny looking fats. There you go. <laughs> and just don't eat that stuff. You don't need the fried calamari. Like It's just not good. Eat the guacamole I instead. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is there are toxins, a variety of toxins that some of which come from mother nature and some of which come from, from man. And if you eat these, even in relatively low amounts, they will affect your mitochondrial function. And the most confusing part that's made this hard for medicine and particularly nutrition is that different DNA, different backgrounds can affect which toxins really mess with you. In my case, in my family history, it turns out somewhere on my mother's side, because this is a mitochondrial thing, mitochondria only come from your mom, not your dad. Mm -hmm. um, my, my people don't handle something called nightshade vegetables very well. And this is potatoes, tomatoes, Good thing hot you're not peppers. Italian. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I just, Italian and Greek food are full of it. And I, I grew up dearly loving green chili in New Mexico. And if I eat even one bite of foods from that family, this is the deadly nightshade family, but some people metabolize it. For me, I get joint pain, brain fog, muffin top. Like, like it's just, it's bad. And, and what if you take the seeds out and peel it? Even if, I, even if I do that, it, it, it just doesn't matter. I'm, I'm highly sensitized to it. And my daughter's not that way, mm -hmm. uh, but I am. And it's irritating, but that doesn't mean for someone listening that it's bad for them. So a third of cases of rheumatoid arthritis are caused by this family. Yeah. It's a mitochondrial problem, but it's only a problem for people with that genetic set. Right. Right. So, so what I recommend people do on the Bulletproof Diet, I, I put a, a set of suspect foods. These are foods that may cause problems for you, but they or may be may good not. for you. Right. Right. So it's not that simple to say, oh, here's the standard you know, MRE, military ready to eat ration that everyone can eat. It's not like that, but you have to know what are your kryptonite foods that lower your mitochondrial function. And the first sign of mitochondrial function, even without lab tests and all the expensive cool stuff, if you eat it and you get a massive sugar craving afterwards, or you get massively tired and you can't remember things, your brain is stuffed with mitochondria. It has the most mitochondria of any part in the body. So you're going to feel it in your brain first. If you mm. can't focus after lunch, and you're just dying for dessert, you ate something that whacked your mitochondria. It may have hit them directly or it may have just crashed your blood sugar like MSG will do. Either way, you crash your blood sugar, your mitochondria freak out and they get stressed. And it's not a good stress. Exercise is a good stress, but that kind of stress is not. 
So you got you got the fried foods, which is going to kill your mitochondria. You've got food toxins, yep. but they're different for different people. But you've also got other things you eat. And what is the main thing? And I've written many books about this. It's a clue. It's a hint. <laughs> grain. <laughs> yes. And the it, answer is? It, the answer is grain. Sugar. Oh, sugar. There we go. I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I would have... I don't know, Mark. I, I don't. I don't like sugar. Sugar is bad for you. But I don't know if sugar is worse than than grains, which are essentially made out of sugar, but yeah. covered with other toxins from yeah. other nature. Yeah. But I, I'm a hundred percent with you. If you eat sugar, especially drink sugar, mm -hmm. what ends up happening is the mitochondria get a burst of sugar, saying "Yay!" But then they're dead. Like there's no, they're not, they don't actually die, but they're they're out of energy, and it's that sudden spike and sudden crash. It causes yeah. metabolic damage far beyond just mitochondria. I mean, we we don't. 152 pounds of sugar and 133 pounds of flour, which is worse than sugar. That's almost three quarters of a pound a day of flour and sugar. That is poison for a mitochondria. And it that really accelerates is. aging and causes this prediabetes and insulin resistance. That is a huge driver. And then there's also other things, toxins, other toxins. And I had mercury poisoning. Yeah, I was about to say mercury, good. I had mercury poisoning and my, I had chronic fatigue syndrome and my muscles were damaged. I had a muscle enzyme called CPK really high, which is really a sign of your muscle cells exploding because there's no energy. Mm -hmm. And it was, I had severe pain and aching all the time. And it was because of these environmental toxins and there's a lot of them. And some people are more susceptible than others. Mercury is a big issue because we've been burning coal for so long that when you burn coal, it releases mercury into the air and then it comes down in rain and gets in our fish. And some types of fish are much better than others. And you and I have both written about yeah. the, the type of fish that you want to eat, like salmon, not not farm salmon, Sardine, but wild salmon, herring, sardines, right. herrings, yeah, anchovies, you know, all the all, all the, the stuff that people don't like. Yeah, I all like the, them. All the stinky <laughs> fish, right? <laughs> but uh, those are the ones that are safest. But I also had mercury poisoning and lead poisoning uh, when I was younger. And I remember the first time I got treated for it, uh, my my wife was like. Dave, your skin is pink. I've never, you've always been gray. And what happens when these toxins are present? Just look a little lead-like. Yeah, you look lead-like. And, and you're actually creating a condition called pseudo-hypoxia, which is when your mitochondria just can't use air in food because they've been poisoned. So you get this sort of backed up system metabolically and you feel gray and your skin looks gray. Your circulation isn't good and you get that horrible muscle pain that was just a part of my life until I was about 30. So what do you do to rebuild and revitalize your mitochondria stay away from sugar fried foods environmental toxins your kryptonite foods but what are the things that we can actually do to rejuvenate them and to live to be 180 well, the good thing is there's way more mitochondrial uh, organelles these little bacteria in your body than there are cells in your body and they are replaceable so the first thing you want to do is you want to tell them only the strong survive and there's a few Is ways that we call to your do book that. Headstrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so you, you sort of need to manage them like a like a system instead of of like little individual things. So you want to take the weakest twenty percent of your mitochondria and you want to tell them die. And that sounds a little bit brutal, but here's what happens when they die: fresh, new, young ones. So how do you in their how place. do you kill them? All right, here's one of my favorite techniques from Headstrong. Tomorrow morning, when you take a shower, take a nice warm shower, at the end of the shower, with the water hitting you right in the forehead and chest, turn it to full cold. And now after about- that sounds like great advice. That's not so it, much fun. I can't wait to do it in the morning. <laughs> at, after eight seconds, you're going to be like, Dave Asprey's a jerk. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you stick with me for four days, the next day you'll do it, you'll last like 20 seconds. And what's going to happen is the voice in your head, which is your mitochondria, is going to say, you're going to die. You must get out. It's unbearable to be in here. But you rationally know, if I'm in here for one minute, I'm not going to die, but it feels like it and you believe that feeling. But what you're doing is you're telling the mitochondria, if you can't make enough energy to keep yourself warm for just a minute of cold water, then you're weak and you should die. And that's them saying, please don't kill me, please don't kill Only me. And you're strong just, survive. you're gonna die. <laughs> right? and, and when you do that, after the fourth day, you're like, you know what? This isn't that cold. In fact, I feel invigorated. My skin is tighter. I'm losing weight. I feel good. I sleep better. Like it's really powerful. And we're talking one minute of cold water, wow. but four days, four days of pain, first and then all of a sudden just just believe me just try it for a week you're like you know what i like my life when i do this you're like the ice man you know yeah <laughs> this is like the the weak version of that you don't have to go swimming no, I, I find uh, you know when i was sick with chronic fatigue the only thing that would give me like a few hours of relief would be to take a steam or a really hot yeah uh, bath and then i would jump in an ice bath correct and that would kind of flush everything out and i'd feel like a minute of clarity and 
energy. And the thing is, this doesn't require liquid nitrogen like we have at Bulletproof Labs do cryotherapy. It's low tech, it's yeah. free, everyone can do it. And if we all just did that, the, the measurable incidence of all chronic disease would go down across the country. Okay, that's a great tip. So what else can we do for a mitochondria? The, there's two kinds of exercise that matter. And I, I looked up all the research on this stuff. And your job with exercise is to make yourself grow healthy young mitochondria, but also to grow more mitochondria. Because who wouldn't want a bigger battery on their iPhone, right? Mm. So one kind of exercise- No service in there in that low battery mode, right? Right. That, that's <laughs> Shut off very, all the operating right. apps and just and, like- and our, our body will do that. You know, the last thing is your brain, but you know, the rest of you, it's like, you don't have to repair it and regenerate. Why would you do that? You don't have enough energy. Just keep it for the brain, mm -hmm. keep it for the lungs. You're totally right. And what I end up doing uh, for this exercise stuff is one body of research says, if you move for 20 minutes a day, it has a set of behavior on maintaining youthful mitochondria. So this means not like running, you don't have to go get all dressed up in your Lulu outfit, although you might want to, but all you have to do is just go for a walk. You don't have to run, you don't have to do anything crazy, just move for 20 minutes a day. That's it? Well, that, that's step one. Okay, Okay. all right, that's not too easy. <laughs> yeah. And if you wanna really grow more mitochondria and get all the benefits for anti-aging, there's another body of research that says at least once and maybe twice a week, you need to do something really hard for 10 to 15 minutes. I Meaning basically exercise hard enough so you're gonna throw up. Pretty much. Uh, it's, <laughs> so what I recommend in, in the book is, is that once a week you wanna sprint and you wanna run about 400 yards like a tiger's chasing you. And then lay down on your back. It's actually important to lay down on your back instead of stand there. Uh -huh. And there's a whole different uh, thing that happens in the brain when you do that uh, around recovering faster. You do that three times and then you know you can just say, all right, I'm done. That's not very much pain and it's not very much work and it actually is gonna replace being on a spinning thing you know, every day for the week. The idea here is- You can exercise far less time and get far more yeah. benefit. In fact, we created Bulletproof Labs in Santa Monica, which is a facility that has equipment to help people do this with technology. Because the idea is, if you're commuting home every day and you're commuting to work and you have kids and a family and responsibilities, you just don't have time yeah. to do 90 minutes it's, a day That's the good out. news. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I read a study years ago where they looked at uh, giving people 30 minutes of interval training, which is what you're mm -hmm. talking about, three times a week, versus 60 minutes, six days a week of just like a run, light jog, yeah. like a regular aerobic exercise. And at the end of 12 weeks, the group that only exercised 30 minutes, three times a week, far less exercise, had 9% less body fat and were far more fit <laughs> doing far less exercise. If you get more fit in less time, it's awesome. And here's what's really going on, Mark, and, and this ties into your functional medicine background. It's relatively easy to whack yourself over the head in the gym. and. There, I see so many CEOs who, well, you know, I'm running my company, I just flew to Japan and back, and I'm gonna do an Ironman triathlon. And I'm like, let me guess. Your adrenals are shot. <laughs> yeah, you can't sleep, you have no sex drive, <laughs> uh, your joints hurt all the time. And like, how did you know? It's like, well, here's what happens when you don't recover enough. Yeah. Uh, well, what happens is exactly that. Hormones crash, adrenals crash, uh, testosterone goes down. Women oftentimes get monthly hormone problems. And it, it just so goes- So if you over-exercise, your sex yeah. life goes to- it, it really does. And also, if you're constantly stimulating instead of recovering, it, it just doesn't work. So our job is to actually be masters of recovery, which means small amounts of targeted stimulation. Great news, that takes less time. And then recovery. And recovery yeah. means you sleep. It also means that if you're in a toxic relationship, that you fix it. It means that if you have a lot of emotional stress, um, old trauma, PTSD, uh, substance abuse problems, eating disorders, you deal with that stuff. Because if you have chronic stress from just being unhappy, mm -hmm. that's enough stress even without exercise. Yeah. And if you have lots of travel stress, you're jet lagged, maybe you don't wanna hit the, the gym really hard. Maybe you just wanna take it easy and get some extra sleep and get a massage. And to recognize that the massage makes you just as good of a person as going to the gym and lifting heavy things. It's recovery that's that good. matters. That's good to know. I'm, I'm gonna write that down my wife. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you, um, you said something there very, you know, hopeful is we can actually change our mitochondria by changing our thoughts, that our thoughts actually are being eavesdropped on by our mitochondria. And that if you have a set of beliefs or attitudes that are 
keeping you stressed because you know you and I live very crazy lives. But oh yeah, both of us aren't really stressed. We just seem to kind of go through every day and you, have a good time and you enjoy can, life, right? You can do big things and still be happy. In fact, uh, my next book uh, comes out in December. One of the big themes in it is that you can only do big things if you work on happiness first, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And whether your goal is to do big things or just do the things that make you happy, you will not have healthy functioning cells if you have a belief system that says everything's a threat. Because the mitochondria, they wanna keep your Petri dish alive no matter what. And if they believe that you believe there's a tiger present, even if the tiger is just the next email or the next Facebook post or the next you know, time that you're getting in a fight with your boss or whatever it is, if that looks like a tiger to a dumb little bacteria, they're gonna constantly change your metabolism to be ready to fight. Mm. And you'll be in that fight or flight mode. And there's a complex thing that happens with uh, neuropeptides, these little tiny chains of amino acids, little protein fragments that are signals throughout the body. And another thing that most people don't know about, when your heartbeat changes to get ready to run away from a tiger, there's a magnetic field around your heart shaped like a donut and it's tipped eight degrees to the left and you can measure this. This isn't the woo-woo side of things. This is hard physics and if there's the electrical current, it makes a magnetic field. We also have proven that mitochondria are sensitive to magnetic fields. Yeah. That means that they're listening to your heart and when you're ready to run, your heartbeat changes predictably and if they're getting that signal and they're getting neuropeptides of stress, they're gonna be like, screw recovery, screw repair. Who, who cares about cancer? There's a tiger here, it's going yeah. to eat me. Cancer doesn't matter. It so, doesn't know, it's such as your imagination that you think your spouse has having an affair which may not be true, you exactly. still get the same response. Exactly, and, yeah. and if that's running the show, your body will naturally make sure that you stay alive right now and not worry about preventing death 20 years from now because hey, if you miss this one, the one down the road doesn't matter. And if you realize they're dumb, they're little bacteria, they care about three things, Mark. This is mitochondria. Number one, run away from, kill, or hide from scary things because if you miss that one, <laughs> it's game over. The Petri dish is dead. Yeah. Okay. Number two, eat everything. Right? Because otherwise, if you don't eat, within a month, you're gonna starve to death. And maybe that's not true for us, but that's what they think they're dumb little bacteria. So the algorithm is eat everything. And this is why if someone puts a plate of cookies in front of you, it's really hard not to think about the cookies. They just keep calling to you. They're actually not calling to you. It's your mitochondria going, hey, is that food? Hey, is that food? Eat it, eat although, it, eat although it. Although I believe if you change your brain chemistry and your hormones that it won't really look like food anymore. That like is, I walk by the Starbucks caray of pastries, those cakes and scones and donuts and muffins, and I'm like... It doesn't look like food. Even if I'm hungry, I'm yeah. like, oh, that doesn't look like food. It's a rock. Why would I eat a rock? <laughs> you, you are absolutely, like, absolutely correct. I used to want to eat it. Yeah. I used to go to like the airport when I was traveling around. You can sneak around and buy a Cinnabon when no one was looking. And I'd get the one with nuts because I thought that was the healthier. <laughs> you know? <But> like, <laughs> I, we've had such a similar path. I, I used to have these cravings like, I've got willpower. I forget. Willpower comes from mitochondria. It's energy. Yeah. Right? I've got willpower. But every time you say no to these, you're using a little bit of willpower until you run out. And then you're like, yeah. I'll just have half the cookie. right? And, and then you feel like a bad person. Well, you're using science, not willpower, yeah. to fix the problem. And it, what happens with me now, the same thing. You look at that, and I'm like, those don't make me feel good. Those aren't food. And I just, I would never eat one. I would rather eat nothing. Like, I would eat it if I wanted to. Like, yeah. I, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to eat if I want to. But like, I just, it doesn't attract me. The anymore. desire is gone. And it's sort of strange. And, and, and sometimes if I get eating a little too much chocolate and sugar, then it starts, oh, that might be interesting to eat. And then I stop and I'm like, it goes away. So it's all hormones and biology. It, it really is. I can tell you in the last 10 years, there's one time I've had grains. And it was actually when we were hanging out, Mark, uh, in, <laughs> in Greece at Vishen Lakhiani's event. And we're, we're on some little Greek island and there's a guy at a little guest house. And he said, here's some baklava. Oh, it was yeah. made by uh, my grandmother oh, from yeah. local uh, weed and honey. Oh, yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm eating that. Yeah, right? I took some charcoal good. with it. I, I, I felt great right? the next day. It's fine. But, it's in Europe, it's better, right? It, it is. <laughs> but, but that sort of thing to, to be willing and acceptance, but just to not see it that way. That's mitochondrial. Yeah. It's part of the, the approach of functional medicine. We, we start them on the elimination diet. So yeah. eliminating all the inflammatory foods, gluten, dairy, processed foods, all that stuff. And That's then you remove, of, right? You That's remove. the remove. In right, the five, the five R's. R's. We remove, right. replace, re-inoculate, you know, repair, repair, rebalance. And, rebalance. Yep. Uh, and, the, and we'll go into each of those because they're really important. But the, 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 the next step is also there's other things we may need to remove. There's tests we need to do. Yes. So what kind of tests would you look at as a functional medicine doctor that you wouldn't see at a traditional doctor's office that give us a roadmap of how to treat these patients? Right, so we did a stool test that looked at his microbiome. And what we noticed is that there was an overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria and unhealthy yeast. So he had this, you know, probably because of years of antibiotics, he developed this 
dysbiosis, this imbalance in the bacteria and mm. yeast. And so there was an overgrowth of the unhealthy things. It's, it's like weeds, having a lot of weeds in your garden, yeah, right? Right. It's not it's it's not always like one of those you think of a stomach infection and you're getting really, really sick, you're throwing up or having diarrhea. This is this it's a it's an imbalance and it's called dysbiosis. But that imbalance causes a lot of symptoms in people. When you have the wrong bacteria and the wrong yeast levels, you know, you can get a lot of bloating after you eat. You can get um, a lot of fatigue after you eat. You can get those symptoms of constipation and diarrhea. And, um, and that causes this inflammation in the digestive system. So all of your digestive enzymes don't work well. So you're not breaking down your food well. You're not absorbing your nutrients well. And it becomes this vicious cycle that people are, are dealing with. And we see all the time. Yeah, it's so it's so powerful. So, so you know, you know, when I see this patient, I'm like, okay, you don't have to do all the tests. But sometimes if you get stuck, you look at, you know, various tests that look at uh, antibodies against things that, that are in the gut that determine a leaky gut. Right. And we call it Cyrex-2 right. testing, which yeah. is a test you can get through you can functional look, medicine Right, doctors. is there, you can test to see if there's leaky gut. I love that test too, yeah. because it's a great way for us to follow up and see how much we're seeing, seeing improvement. Right. Are we doing enough? Right. Um, are we seeing improvement in, in, in their leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability? And then we look at poop testing. Like, you yes. know, where we do thousands and thousands of these tests. And mm -hmm. it's so helpful. And it doesn't just look at the microbiome. It actually looks at the function of the gut. Yes. Like uh, whether there's malabsorption, yep. whether you had no digestive enzymes, whether there's inflammation, whether yep. there's overactive antibodies in there, whether you have uh, imbalances in what we call the short-chain fats, which are the, the, the food for the colon that are produced by bacteria eating the right kinds of fiber. And if they're low, it means there's an imbalance. Then we look at the microbiome, and we yep. look at what grows, we look at parasites. And then we, we target and micro-target the things that are out of balance for that person, and it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we might look at food sensitivity testing, we might look at, at um, and even things like heavy metals or other yep. things which can also cause it. I had a patient with ulcerative colitis once, and I did everything right, I did the whole 5R, it wasn't working. But I forgot the first part of the R, which is remove. And I, I thought, well, maybe, you know, heavy metals can cause autoimmunity. Maybe it's a problem. Uh -huh. And so I tested him and he was like wasted away and he was like, yeah. it was terrible. He actually had high levels of mercury. We treated his mercury and his colitis went away. So which is I, phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, it's so powerful. And this case is so important because it really describes how a patient, you know, goes to a traditional doctor, is diagnosed with a disease irritable bowel syndrome, by the way, anytime you hear syndrome, it means doctors know what the heck's going on. It's just a collection of symptoms that we agree we're going to put in this bucket. And if you have those symptoms, you have this disease, but it's not really a disease. Right. And, and so that's what functional medicine is. It sort of looks upstream to figure out what the root causes are yep. and, and, and personalize the treatment for everybody. And there's common things that we do like the five R, but it's it maybe different R's for each patient, right? Right. Right. So for him, we removed you know, the inflammatory foods, and we removed the bacteria and yeast. I actually treated him with an, uh, an, an antibiotic, a non-absorbed antibiotic, and an antifungal. Um, so I treated him with a prescription weed medication. <laughs> yeah, weed killer. Um, so that was the remove, yeah. right? And then the replace, because he was underweight and because of that inflammation in his digestive system, I gave him some digestive enzymes for a short period of time just to mm. help him, mm. to help it so the food wasn't as inflammatory for him and to help him absorb more nutrients. Mm. Um, and then we then we worked on re-inoculating, right? Yep. So after we, we gave him some good probiotics. Put in the healthy bacteria. Put in the healthy bacteria. Some good prebiotics, prebiotics yeah. right? So we know that what there's- What are prebiotics? Prebiotics are the, are the things that help feed the good bacteria. So they're the food for yeah. the probiotics. Which is usually what? Like, like fibers. Fibers are amazing prebiotics. We know a lot of phytonutrients are prebiotics. So this, I think, is really exciting research when we're looking at our phytonutrients. You know, we know what that- What are phytonutrients? Right, so plant, <laughs> I know, it's amazing, right? So, so our food has, has um, minerals in it, it has vitamins, but it also has these things called phytonutrients, which are these components in our plant foods that um, have this amazing health benefits for us. So mm. that can include things like el elagic acid that we see in pomegranate that can feed some of the good bacteria, that acromancia that we yeah. know can lower inflammation. We know that... Um, just, just to back up on that acromancia thing. So when we look at the poop, we can tell if there's like good levels of different bugs. Yep. And one of them we look at is acromancia. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that is so important for protecting your gut. 
It, it yes. helps you keep your biofilm or that little coating over the gut so you don't have a leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And it's involved in so many autoimmune diseases and response to cancer therapy and, and metabolic issues and weight. And it's such an overlooked thing. And you can't take a probiotic of it, at least not yet. Right. But you can feed it, the good guys. Right, we can right? feed it. We can feed it with all these amazing phytonutrients like the what's in pomegranate, um, the elagic acid. And also we know that sulforaphane from our cruciferous vegetables feeds the good bacteria. Yeah. You know, um, so broccoli, collards, yeah. kale, but not juicing. <laughs> <laughs> right, Brussels sprouts, all those good ones. Um, we know that green tea, you know, that has good phytonutrients in it that's good for the digestive system. So we always say to people, you know, get something from every color of the rainbow every day. You know, you get some plant foods from every color of the rainbow every day. Get some good red foods like the pomegranate or cranberry. Yeah. Um, get something orange and yellow and green, blue, purple, <laughs> white, tan. You know, those all those good healthy plant foods um, that we, you know, like our vegetables, our fruits, our spices, our teas, our coffees, really actually are impacting our microbiome, yeah. which is, is fascinating. It's so great. And, you know, just a great uh, anecdote from a colleague of mine, Dr. Lee, who was on our podcast mm -hmm. talking about eat to beat disease. His mother had stage four uterine cancer. And being the smart doc he is, he understood from the research that if you have low acromancia, Patients don't respond to the immunotherapy, what they call the checkpoint inhibitors, which is this right. new form of cancer therapy that helps activate your immune system. So mm -hmm. if your gut isn't healthy, you can't actually get the cancer cells to die with the immunotherapy. Right. So it's basically you die unless you have good bacteria in your gut. And so his mother was had stage four uterine cancer and was going to die yep. and wasn't responding. And he gave her pomegranate, cranberry, green tea, mm -hmm. all these phytochemicals got yes. her acromancia levels up, and she was cured of her stage four cancer within a month. That's a phenomenal story. Yeah. It's an incredible story, and I think wow. that just shows the power of these plant uh, foods, of the right? plant foods and of getting focused on the gut. So sleep is when we're repairing the powers of both the mind and the body. Um, sleep is when we um, reduce inflammation, repair tissues, um, the discovery of the glymphatic system in 2012, 2013 is this passive channel that runs alongside our arteries and, and veins in the brain that fills with fluid when we're in deep sleep and allows a washing out of debris we may have accumulated during the day. Things so like, all those bad thoughts get washed out. Well, not the bad, well, the bad <laughs> thoughts, no, but the, but the amyloid plaque, that sticky plaque yeah. that we secrete in response to inflammation or, or injury, if it accumulates, of course, it can damage surrounding neurons and is associated with neurodegenerative disease and Alzheimer's disease. So in English, that means if you don't sleep, you're likely to get demented. <laughs> it's definitely playing a role. Yeah. And, and this concept of bidirectionality, we know that uh, sleep disruption, circadian rhythm disruption, sleep apnea is present in two thirds of people with insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, diabetes. And it is a chicken and the egg thing. It is driving the bus. You know, we used to think, well, you get the sleep apnea because you have insulin resistance and gain weight. But if you have disrupted sleep, your insulins are higher, your cortisols are higher, your glucose is higher, you're looking for highly processed, quick, energy-dense foods and less able to resist them. Wow, so not sleeping is a risk factor for obesity. Absolutely. And heart disease. Yes. And cancer. And cancer. And dementia. And flares and of diabetes. autoimmune conditions. Yeah. And chronic pain. Yeah. And fibromyalgia. So yeah. it re and anxiety and depression. I mean, it really affects Oh my everything. God, if I don't sleep, I'm depressed and anxious. But the more you worry about it, the harder it gets to sleep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, okay, so we have that chronic stress. What, yes. what, else is, what else is driving this insomnia pandemic, which is huge, right? How many, 70, 90 million people are struggling with insomnia? Right. So I do think that there's a, a, a need to address underlying contributors to anxiety and depression independent mm. of their impact on sleep. So talking about what's going on, bringing in some kind of breath-based practice, whether that's yoga or Tai Chi or meditation, just to ratchet everything down. That's another important component of it. Yeah. And thirdly, you've already touched on a little bit about the dopamine with the foam, but it's also the dysregulation in our circadian rhythms. You know, we think about how I, there's been a lot of research about how important it is to avoid light exposure at night, for example. But everything we do during the day and when we do it is ultimately going to influence our ability to go to sleep when we want to and get the rest that we want to. So in other words, when we're eating all day long and snacking late at night and watching TV at night, 
That's our signaling our, yes, and on our computers, that's telling our bodies and brain that it's day, it's day, it's day. Mm -hmm. So we want to actually con uh, reestablish a consistent circadian rhythm. Um, meal timing, so we're having eating earlier in the day and then building in a fasting interval before we go to bed. So don't eat three hours before bed. No. Interestingly enough, there's, um, as you know, there's a connection as well with digestive function that eating late at night not only disrupts your sleep, but it's contributing to higher reflux, which yeah. can also interrupt sleep. So everything's interconnected. I happened to me last night, actually, because I, <laughs> I went hiking and it's summer and it's so beautiful and it's late and light. Mm -hmm. So we were like, didn't get down from the mountain until eight o'clock at night. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh, let's go eat. I'm hungry. But then by the time we ate, it was like nine o'clock. <laughs> and I, like last night, I, I tossed and turned for a couple hours before I went to bed, which I usually don't do. Isn't that I'm interesting? I'm like, oh, it was the, you know, <laughs> it was the eating late at night. So there's, there's eating late at night. There's, there's the circadian rhythm disruption. Mm -hmm. And this morning I went out and sat on my deck and the sunshine was out. So you're getting light in the morning is so important. Absolutely. So we don't do that. We're all like on our phones or computers right away. We need the natural light to reset our brain. It makes our, a big difference. Light, light is medicine. Right? It is. Light is medicine. It is. And and also it could be bad medicine if it's the wrong light at the wrong time, right? Exactly. So we have all this like, like the, there's this great book called Lights Out that I read years ago, uh, Cindy, that was really talking about the advent of the light bulb driving chronic disease because of the, of the disruption in our rhythms and so on. It's interesting. They've yeah. even looked at LED street lights yeah. disrupting the circadian rhythm of animals and yeah. insects too. Yeah. So it's not just humans that are being impacted yeah. by this. And there's some other weird stuff that affects sleep that we don't think about. Like, uh, what else? Well, one of the conditions is restless leg syndrome. And that's, it, it's hard to diagnose. It's more of what we call a clinical diagnosis. People describe this creepy crawly sensation in their legs or this irresistible urge to rub their feet together. And typically it's um, treated with dopamine medications. It's connected to relatively low dopamine levels in the brain. You know, dopamine, yes, revs you up, but dopamine also seems to play a role with movement. Yeah. So it's treated sure. with some of the same medications they used to treat Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that that can be uh, more prevalent in people who have autoimmune conditions, in which case we want to address the underlying autoimmune conditions. There are some nutrient deficiencies that are going to make rest, this symptom of restless legs more like. significant. Low iron, low vitamin D, low folic acid, low magnesium. So we really want to look at somebody's nutritional status. Yeah. And by the way, 80% of the population is deficient in vitamin D, 50% yeah. in magnesium, you know, like 20% right. in iron. I mean, it's like a lot of people are deficient in the B vitamins and they don't even know it. Right. You know, and you go to your doctor and you have insomnia, they're not checking those things. Exactly. And there's even weirder things than nutritional stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So if we identify a nutrient deficiency, for example, the next yeah. step is why? What's the why that somebody's mm -hmm. nutrients might be low? And there we come back, like so many other things, to the function of the <clears> gut. Um, and interestingly enough, there is a higher correlation in people who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth also having restless leg syndrome. Maybe because it's contributing to ongoing inflammation, maybe mm. because it's also contributing to difficulty absorbing those nutrients from your food. Yeah. So we're even going to go a step further and say, is there an underlying issue with digestive function absorption and assimilation of nutrients that are So if critical? your gut's a mess, it can also cause insomnia. Absolutely. And then heavy metals are another big one that we don't really hear about. Right. Lead, mercury, things that, that are under the radar for many, many people and unfortunately can be a problem. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I had that. <laughs> I mean, talked about it on the show, but I, I've had mercury poisoning you know, 30 years ago almost, and it really totally screwed up my sleep. And what was, happened with your sleep? I just couldn't sleep. Like I just, I was just really couldn't fall asleep, couldn't stay asleep, never felt rested, had chronic fatigue syndrome until I got the mercury out, got my fillings out, chelation, everything. I couldn't sleep. Uh, wow. And it really took a long time to reset that. Okay, so we've got all these different things that traditional medicine is ignoring, the hormonal mm -hmm. fluctuations, the, the gut issues, heavy metals, nutrient deficiencies. I mean, doctors know about sleep apnea, but they often miss it in thin women mm -hmm. because that's not the archetype of someone who actually <laughs> like the Pickwickian <laughs> figure with, you know, a huge belly and a mm -hmm. thick throat and size 17 neck. I mean, you know, uh, so there's all these issues and, and yet... Um, you know, this continues to be such a struggle for so many people. Uh -huh. um, and the and the traditional treatments really are just stopgap. They don't really uh -huh. address the cause. So in functional medicine, the way we think about things is 
to look at some of these other factors. Mm -hmm. So, so in your practice, any how do you how do you start to dig down? What are the kinds of diagnostic things you look at differently? We talked about all these different factors, but how do you identify what's the problem in this or that particular person? Well, I think it's the time to take a history and really understand all of the other interconnectedness that could be going on. For example, somebody with sleep concerns might also have digestive concerns, and then we might be thinking about assessing their digestive function, um, looking at a nutritional assessment. But I think there's a time and a place, and there's tremendous value in screening somebody with a, a portable sleep study, because that gives you a tremendous amount of information. And we're using it, yes, to diagnose sleep apnea, but also to say, how often do you wake up during the night? Um, how much percentage of time are you spending in REM sleep and deep sleep? Are you tossing and turning all night long? So it can give us a tremendous overview in terms of somebody's sleep throughout the night. And from that, we can also decide, okay, what else do we need to explore? Mm. And, and then we do some testing, right? You can, mm -hmm. look at, you can look at nutritional levels. You can look at these vitamin D and magnesium mm -hmm. and folate and and iron studies. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at this, obviously the sleep apnea test, and there's home tests now. You can do mm -hmm. that really great. Um, we look at heavy metals, right? Mm -hmm. And the hormones. You can really get a sense of what's right. going on with hormones for people. If their estrogen and progesterone is all out of balance, it just happens in menopause. You see a lot of sleep issues. <clears throat> um, heavy metals, like I said, we can test. So th there's there's a lot of ways we can diagnose using functional medicine mm -hmm. testing that you don't really get with traditional doctors that can help get underneath things. Um, so. Tell me about this this patient you had because you know it sort of speaks to a lot of the issues that we're talking about, and it gives you a little unusual approach to insomnia, something you wouldn't really get from a traditional doctor. Right. So this is somebody that, and 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 one of the things I want to plant the seed for is sometimes we start with what we think is the most likely issue, and we gradually uncover more potential contributing issues and peel the layers of the onion. And this was a woman that I had known for years. She was pretty healthy in terms of her lifestyle. She exercised. She wasn't overweight. She ate a healthy diet. Um, she didn't drink any alcohol. She was treated with antidepressants. She was on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and Wellbutrin for her depression. Um, and she started, she was also on hormone replacement therapy. She was postmenopausal in her 60s. And she started complaining of fatigue and difficulty concentrating and just felt scattered. And by Sundays, she would have the need to take a three hour nap. So, well, that's unusual. So we did some of the usual testing for causes of fatigue. We tested her thyroid, it was okay. We looked at her iron levels or sugar levels, they were okay. So I decided to do screen her with a sleep study. Mm. And it turned out, you would not have looked at her and said, oh yes, she is the poster child for sleep apnea. Um, she turned out to have one of the most striking positional components to sleep apnea I've ever seen. When she was on her side, her sleep was normal, but when she was on her back, she had respiratory events that count as either a slowing of airflow or a stopping of airflow more than 60 times an hour. Wow. Well, more she than stopped breathing 60 times an yes. hour. Yes, yes. Like once a minute. <laughs> That's a lot. No yeah. wonder she was exhausted, right? Um, so in when you see a positional component like that, you know, I have people who don't want to do a sleep study because they don't want to, I don't, I'm dead, I'd never wear that stupid mask. But for her, we said, okay, well, let's start with retraining you to learn to sleep on your side. And she tried that. There's some commercially available positional devices. There are all kinds of strategies you There's can do. There's a very, very sophisticated technology it's called the tennis ball yes. <laughs> strategy, where you sew a tennis ball into a t-shirt on the back. So if you roll over on your back, it makes you flip over to your side. Or the fanny pack with the pillow stuffed in it. Yes, yeah. there's all kinds of strategies you can do. And of course, it's it's big business, right? You can buy a slumber bump or a bumper belt. Oh, I didn't know they had those. That's good. I was still on the tennis ball track. <laughs> uh, even more sophisticated, there's now a biofeedback device that's a strap around that vibrates when you roll on your back. So it's sort of oh. autogenic nighttime training to wow. get you. So that's what she used, interestingly enough. Mm. And it helped a little, but she was still tired. So as we're peeling the layers of the onion, she had some digestive symptoms, a lot of bloating, a lot of discomfort. Um, and she had, we had done a full sleep study. She had restless legs and periodic limb movements. Mm -hmm. She turned out to have a very abnormal breath test uh, for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That means bugs growing in your small intestine where they usually Where they don't grow. belong, right. right, right. Which can cause inflammation. Absolutely. And low iron. Her iron wasn't terribly low, but um, one of the sidebars here, I think the other thing we do in functional and integrative medicine is understand the difference between a normal blood test, I should put 
quote, normal blood test and an optimal blood test. Yeah. Ferritin is a classic example of that. Ferritin looks at your total tissue iron. And I but think how much iron is in your, in your iron bank in your body? In your iron bank, your iron stores, right. And normal can be anywhere from 15 to 250. Yeah. So it's a big range. It's a big range. And what we know the threshold is for somebody who's got restless leg symptoms is you actually don't want to be normal. You want to be over 100. Because there's some evidence, even comparing it head to head with those dopamine drugs we mentioned earlier, getting somebody's ferritin over 100 was as effective as the dopamine medications. That's amazing. That's amazing, right? Yeah. As simple as correcting a nutrient deficiency, not to the normal range, but the optimal range for that condition. Yeah, it was interesting. Sure. Is, you know, if, if you know, heme iron is the right, the best absorbed kind of iron, but that usually comes from meat. Right. And if people are vegan, the, the plant forms of iron aren't as well absorbed. Right. And you often see very significant iron deficiency in these patients, especially women who are menstruating. And I think that, um, you know, uh, I learned actually in traditional medicine that ferritin was connected to sleep. Actually, interesting. Yeah, I learned that uh, at a lecture. On insomnia they went to by some drug company <laughs> well, that's great <laughs> i was like well wow, that's interesting but but uh, yeah i think it's it's a, something that's often overlooked and it's an easy blood test to check your ferritin which, which most doctors won't look at um, and, and mark i think from the internal medicine standpoint too it's equally important to say don't just correct the iron figure out the why right you don't want to miss yeah she got blood colon cancer somewhere. absolutely she a, a stomach ulcer she's just menstruating heavily does she have a right. bladder cancer or just like something right. Right? right so i think that's really important you're right just don't look at the symptom, look at the cause. Right. Because low iron is a symptom. Right. It's not a cause. Right. It caught me, low iron may cause insomnia, but what causes low iron? So that's what functional medicine does. It keeps going upstream. And you, you, you said something a couple of times that I just want to come back to, which is peeling the onion. So one of the principles of functional medicine from our mentor, Sid Baker, who is this uh, cool old guy, Yale professor, uh, erudite, super smart, one of the most thoughtful men in medicine, people in medicine, period. And uh, he said, you know, we, we have the tack rules that help us <laughs> to determine how to figure things out. One is if you're standing on a tack, it takes a lot of aspirin to make you feel better, right? Take mm -hmm. out the tack. So if, you know, the bacterial overgrowth is causing the restless leg syndrome, you can take a lot of these traditional medications, right. but it can take a lot of medication to make it away. Or if you fix the bacterial overgrowth and the, you know, that'll help. But then also if you're standing on Two tacks, taking one of them out doesn't make you 50% better. <laughs> so she had bacterial overgrowth and she had iron yeah. and she had the positional thing. So it's like usually three or four or five things. And the problem with medicine is we are so focused on the one thing, you right. know. You know, there was one other piece related to her story that I think is also important to call out. Addressing all of those things, her sleep quality was still not what she wanted to be. So we had a conversation and she relayed the fact that when she was growing up, things were pretty unsettled in her home of origin. There were a lot of late night parties, a lot of noise, and bedtime became a time where she didn't really feel safe and quiet and comfortable. So we also talked about referring her to a life management behavioral therapist to really talk about what it meant to be safe and regaining that sense of being okay, being in bed. And I think that's that goes hidden as well, that a previous um, history of trauma or not feeling safe can also show up with insomnia and difficulty sleeping. Yeah, and I think that's a big thing for a lot of people. Um, yeah. You know, there's a questionnaire you can do online called the ACE questionnaire, mm -hmm. it's Adverse Childhood Events, mm -hmm. and you get a score. <laughs> and if you have a high score, it means you've had a crappy childhood and yeah. you probably have some level of trauma. And different people respond differently to the trauma. Of course. But, you know, PTSD is so prevalent and, and mm -hmm. our nervous systems are so jacked up in general. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like acute on chronic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, we've got like our acute stresses on this chronic level of PTSD. And it leads to so many physical, psychological, emotional stresses for people that... And, the, and there's a lot of ways to sort of access that, you know, I mean, there's, you, you, you shared about how you use cognitive behavioral therapy or yoga or meditation or mm -hmm. breath work or, mm -hmm. um, you know, emotional freedom techniques. There's all kinds of techniques out mm -hmm. there, but now people are exploring, you know, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, mm -hmm. MDMA, psilocybin therapy, it's legal in Oregon now. And there, you know, there's some interesting research going on, Johns Hopkins and New York, NYU and others are really looking at how do we help people with some of these chronic long-term traumatic events and experiences. Uh, and, and I think, you know, sort of listening to, it's just so interesting to hear that you're dealing with, you know, something as simple as insomnia, 
<laughs> it can be quite complicated. Mm -hmm. You have to look at inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. It's like, where's it coming from? Is it the gut? Is it heavy metals? Is it hormonal changes? Is it nutrient deficiencies? Is it maybe it's food sensitivities or allergies? Maybe it's low thyroid. Uh, there's things that we, you know, we just don't often think about. And so what's so satisfying with functional medicine is we're able to actually dig into these things mm -hmm. and look and see the why. You know, we say functional medicine is the medicine of why, not what, not what disease you have, which is helpful, but it's not the end of the story. We go, well, why do you have that disease? Like, you know, and, and that's the challenge with traditional medicine. It's like you make the diagnosis and you stop thinking. Okay, you've got depression. Here's antidepressant. You've got insomnia, take the sleep pill. Oh, you've got rheumatoid arthritis, take the rheumatoid arthritis pill. Like, not why do you have insomnia or depression or rheumatoid arthritis or migraines, but like why? And, and that's what's so powerful. So, and then you sort of, there's some basic sleep practices that are really mm -hmm. good. We've, we've covered some of this, but I think it'd be good to go over it. And I think, um, you know, it, it, and I think it's, it's important to emphasize that everything matters. Sleep, exercise, stress. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, uh, your diet plays mm -hmm. a huge role, nutrient mm -hmm. status. Uh, and that's what we do in functional medicine, so we dig down into it. So talk about some of the um, the other factors around sleep hygiene that we sort of haven't touched on uh, in terms of diet and lifestyle and food and exercise. And sure. I think, I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that sleep, you know, you and I trained in an era where sleep deprivation or how little sleep you could get by on was a badge of honor. Yeah. So oh. we need to shift that internal... Yeah dialogue that that we all have that oh if i'm not if i'm sleeping i'm wasting my time and i'm not getting my stuff done so first honor the importance of sleep for your overall health and well-being and even your ability to stick to your intentions around choosing healthy foods and sticking to your exercise plan then create a sanctuary that's really conducive for rest and relaxation dark quiet cool ideally electronics out of the bedroom uh, or turned off if you can um, getting rid of all of the light exposures, even your chargers, you know, that had that Yeah, like light. those like lights, like oh. those, those red, green lights on different <laughs> devices. I'm like, that drives me crazy. I used to, I had a patient who told me she traveled around with black electrical tape whenever That's she went to a hotel idea. and she would put it over all the little light sources in the hotel I, I travel with eye shades because yeah. you never know where you're going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, those two, quiet, um, calming. And I think this idea that you go, 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 hop in bed and turn it off like a switch, that doesn't work either. So building in a transition to rest and relaxation. If you can do an hour, that's great. And getting off the devices, not watching TV, maybe reading a book or journaling or doing something, taking a bath, stretching in the tub. I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful ways to ease into to rest and relaxation. I like the hot Epsom salt bath with lavender drops because the lavender lowers your cortisol, the magnesium relaxes you, and the sulfur and the Epsom salt helps you detox. That's and my favorite you, as well. And then you go to your cool bedroom and you do your legs up the wall yoga, yeah. restorative yoga position, yeah. and yeah. bingo, you've got your transition to rest and relaxation. So powerful. And and alcohol obviously is a good uh, for people. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. So so the rough analogy is this. Um, for every, it's funny um, when they asked partners of people with insomnia how many of them were suggesting that they have a drink to go to sleep. It was about a third of them. So people think alcohol is going to help you sleep, and it might make you fall asleep. But mm -hmm. then, as it clears out of your system, there's an arousal. It can exacerbate hypoglycemia. It makes you wake up. It's going to make sleep apnea worse. If you're a woman in midlife, oh boy, it's a bladder irritant. It's a hot flash trigger. So it's really affecting sleep in a lot of ways. The rough equivalent is there's about an hour of sedation followed by an hour of arousal. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had a glass of wine at six and you go to bed at 10, it's probably not going to impact your sleep as much as if you have two glasses at eight or like your late dinner last night, if you had a glass or two of wine. Yeah, I had a beer. Yeah. Had a beer. <laughs> that has another impact on your sleep. I just right? noticed it. Actually, I had an, an aura ring for a while uh -huh. and I was tracking my sleep. And I noticed whenever I drank, my sleep pattern was so disrupted. Yeah. Quality of sleep, the depth of sleep, the amount of REM sleep, deep sleep, uh, snoring, you know, all that. Isn't it's that really interesting. Fascinating. And then caffeine also is another big one, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and we're all we're all different in terms of our caffeine metabolism ability. Uh, some people are really fast metabolizers. Me, sorry, fast metabolizers. I happen to be one of those. Um, but if you're a slow metabolizer, half of your cup of coffee from noon could still be in your system at nine o'clock at night. And most of the time, we're not thinking back to that mm -hmm. noon cup of coffee. 
Um, with food, it's really about quality, quantity, and timing of food. It's all three. Um, yet another area that's impacted with the health of the gut microbiome is sleep. And data is suggesting that people who eat a, a wide variety of colorful fruits and vegetables tend to have better sleep quality, whereas a highly processed standard American diet is associated with more sleep disruptions and less deep sleep. So quality matters. We already touched a little bit on the timing of eating. So eating your calories earlier in the day um, also helps re-regulate those circadian rhythms. So this, the clocks in the brain and the clocks in the body uh, that are ideally gonna be working in sync with each other they're influenced by light, by movement, and by food. So when we line all those things up during the day, it's gonna help us get the rest that we need at night. So important, this is such good information. Let's talk about what are the challenges uh, that you see in your clinical practice around women and sleep? And, and what are the main reasons that you're finding? And some of them are expected. Right. Uh, and, then, and then let's go into how, you know, there would be traditionally approached by, by conventional medicine. And then we'll dive into functional medicine. Sure. So I think the first thing is that some common sleep conditions like insomnia and restless legs, they disproportionately affect women and they can have a connection to lifestyle. Um, sleep apnea, interestingly enough, gets underdiagnosed for women. Um, and there's a lot of reasons which you can d dive into it, but some of it has to do with stereotypes on the part of clinicians of thinking about sleep apnea being a man's condition, a big, especially if you're overweight, guy, right? right? Especially putting weight on around the right, <laughs> right. Yeah. But lean women can get sleep apnea too, and it may show up very differently. Yeah. Um, there's also the idea that when we look at times of hormonal fluctuation for women, whether that's before their periods or during pregnancy or the postpartum or the menopause transition, that can also cause an uptick in, in disrupted sleep. So hormone balance and regulating hormones can, can play a huge role in improving yeah. sleep quality. Yeah. Um, and finally, you know, disproportionately in the past, caregiving demands have fallen on the shoulders of women. And I think that really became manifest or evident during the COVID-19 pandemic when you saw a bigger proportion of women than men experiencing an uptick in insomnia, anxiety, and depression. So they're all interconnected. Yeah. So women take on the burden of the families. They, they often, especially during the perimenopausal years, become the sandwich generation between raising their kids and taking care of their elder parents. And you, you're you kind of in the middle of that, kind a little bit towards the tail end <laughs> yes. of it, but you kind of went through that. And uh, it puts a lot of stress on women. Also, I think there's some there's some unusual causes of sleep mm -hmm. that get missed by traditional medicine. Uh, and, 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 and so, like, if you were a woman and you went to the doctors, like, I'm having insomnia, what are they going to tell you? They'll probably tell you to take a sleeping pill. A little Ambien. A little Ambien, yes. A little yes. Valium, right? <laughs> and or maybe they'll give you an antidepressant, right? Right, right. And uh, of course, those come with side effects. They're Absolutely. addictive. They impair cognition. They have all kinds of um, long-term effects. I mean, the benzos or things like Valium and Lorazepam or Ativan, they, they may lead to increased cognitive problems like dementia when you get older. Ambient, you know, we heard all the stories about people wandering around doing stuff they shouldn't do <laughs> in the middle of the night. And, uh, it's it's unfortunate that that uh, there are other things too that traditional medicine misses that affect sleep. Um, you talked about the big ones, which are the stress and the sleep apnea mm -hmm. and the hormonal issues, but there there's really more uh, mm -hmm. that we know about sleep disruption. And right. the, the difference with functional medicine is that we tend to take a detective approach. We don't just stop at the diagnosis. Insomnia is a symptom. It's not a disease, right? right? <laughs> and so we go, oh, I know it's why you can't sleep. You have insomnia. No, that's just the name of it, silly. That's not the cause. <laughs> and so we, we kind of have a different approach. And there, over the years, you know, there are things we really uncovered in functional medicine that, that play a role in sleep that are mostly ignored. And so you, you shared a little bit about it earlier when we were chatting, but what, what are the kinds of other things that we see underlying the root causes of insomnia? So if we think about insomnia, about 80% of people who develop chronic insomnia, there's an initial inciting event, but it leads to a, a stressful event, for example, and there's sleep. Like a death or a divorce. Uh... Right. Or a transition with the job. And I think the pandemic has, has contributed yeah. to it as well. Yeah. But then what happens is there's this upregulation of the HPA axis and this chronic- What's that? <laughs> overproduction of HPA cortisol. is- 
hypothalamic the, pituitary adrenal axis. So, so it's the, the brain's command center that tells the body what to do. Absolutely. Okay. So it's that connection between what our brain is registering as a threat and how that impacts our need to respond to that threat by pumping out these hormones that then in turn keep us ready to deal with a threat that may not be there anymore. So basically, if you're in fight or flight, your your job isn't to go take a nap. So it is not. It's to so, stay on alert so yeah, it's a run. and wait for the next thing that's going right, to threaten right, you. Right, right, right. So that, that activated sympathetic nervous system is huge. Uh, and, and our culture just does that. But Absolutely. The phone is like a dopamine uh, you know, uh, it, it pump. <laughs> it's like <laughs> a dopamine pump that keeps your blood pressure up. I mean, you know, what, when people are dying in the intensive care unit, the drug we give them to keep their heart going is dopamine, <laughs> right? And that's, that's what a great analogy, you know. And so, like, it's like at the very end of life, like if you can't, if everything else, epinephrine fail, everything, you give dopamine because it's so powerful at keeping you awake and alive. And so, what everything in our life is the sugar, the phones, all the new, like it's just we're constantly in a dopamine barrage. You know, it's funny you said that because I've had people tell me, you know, I wake up at 1.30 every night. And I said, well, how do you know it's 1.30? Because I look at my phone and right. I says 1.30. And that, again, perpetuates the cycle because then you're thinking, oh, it's 1.30. Mm -hmm. Oh, crap. I'm awake. I should be asleep. And then it just becomes. Yeah. You know, the best thing I ever did for my sleep issues, because I struggle with them as well, mm -hmm. is, um, is, is putting my phone and my watch off. Like just yes. taking everything out and like not knowing what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> and just letting my body do its thing. I think that's brilliant, Mark. When you eat more processed foods, which means simple sugars, mm -hmm. trans fats, <clears throat> um, and, and a lot of simple carbs in all those ways that, you know, it's not just sugar, folks. It's like, you know, you know, fructose syrup and what I love corn corn syrup solids right now they changed the name of high fructose corn right syrup. it was like it's like sounds like a corn kind of like corn syrup you know? like, ma it's like maple vegetable. syrup you know? and so uh th those are you know the things that, that certainly we want folks to to avoid and um, what does the data say? If you eat uh, highly processed foods, you have you know fifty to one hundred percent increased risk of clinical depression. Oh, if you eat high glycemic index foods, there's a great uh, study that came out a colleague at Columbia uh, looking at high glycemic index foods. So those are foods that just spike your blood sugar more. Those uh, uh, have a significant increased risk. Uh, individuals have an increased risk of depression. The Women's Health Initiative, so big big study yeah. of of women <clears throat> ages forty five plus. And so there's that correlational data, and it's just consistent. When you look at the meta-analyses of it, yeah. it's consistent that the food that we've created in the last 100 years leads to uh, an increased risk or increased risk in that population of depression. Same data for ADHD. Yeah. Not as much data for anxiety disorders, which is interesting, uh, but, but certainly feels true to me clinically. Then we move on to randomized controlled trials. And the reason this is of interest is, is on the molecular side, like in the mouse models, I mean, yeah. you know this, in the, I mean, you know, not having enough nutrients and putting lots and lots of fuel in what any sort of mouse. mouse look like? Yeah, I mean, what, what depressed mice look like? I mean, it, 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 there's very, it's very clear what depressed mice look like is you stick them in little cages and they don't try and, uh, and you put them in to swim. It's a forced swim test. And when mice are depressed, they don't fight to get out. They just stop swimming. They drown. We we don't let them drown, but but they would drown if you didn't fish them out. Whereas yeah. non depressed mice, yeah. they're fighting to get out. Yeah, that's what a depressed mouse looks like. So the randomized controlled trials that came out recently are exciting because we can say it makes common sense. We can say on a molecular level it makes lots and lots of sense. We can say it makes sense in the correlational data. But you and I know, Mark, medicine's not going to change until we have randomized clinical trials. And that's where folks like uh, Felice Jacka and Michael Burke and the Food and Mood Center in Australia, they're really, I would say, the leaders in this, where they've, they've completed a number of trials. Natalie Parletta uh, is also um, not part of that group, but say part of the leaders in this. And, and now they're putting down numerous randomized trials and creating resources for patients with mental health concerns like depression yeah. to make sure food's part of the equation. And, and their data looks quite strong. And, and what I love about this is when the data comes out, it's funny, one of the big leaders in psychiatry, um, won't mention him by name, but been very critical, gets really critical. It's funny, there's a big, big post about how in some, you know, one of these health medicine review websites about, you know, how, how bad the trial was or how small it was. Or it's like yeah, yeah. fighting. And I'm Everybody's thinking, always criticizing each other about the study. And I was like, <laughs> so when we don't have data, you say there's no data. And then when people do a really good trial, you want to pick it apart. Yeah. 
and there's some feeling that that it, it it's it's it, it's almost like you know folks have really people in like paradigm shifts well i mean is this how bad it's gotten mark that we're yeah. at a paradigm shift we're suggesting that our our patients our neighbors our families eat well for things like uh, when they're thinking about their brain and their mood and their dementia yeah. risk and their depression, like we've gotten so far down the rabbit hole of medicine that that's a paradigm shift. Yeah. Like that, yeah, that's, crazy. Th- it is absolutely not. And, and there's, you're right. There's so much data. Like, the, you know, might be aware of Hiblin's work, which was from the NIH, Joe, where he showed the Captain Joe. Captain, yeah, Joe. Captain Joe Hiblin Joe is right. like, a, he's a pretty cool guy. He's the, uh, he's the leader of the, what he, he calls himself the, uh, he is the uh, surgeon, he's the surgeon general's, he's a soldier in the surgeon general's army. <laughs> there you go. And he did these amazing studies looking at the rise of omega 3, omega, I mean, the rise of omega 6 fats, refined oils. And the decrease in omega-3 fats leading to violence, homicide, suicide, uh, and that changed behavior. And I remember once coming back from, you know, somewhere and I had a letter on my desk uh, in my office. And it was from a prisoner who wrote me a letter, wrote my, read my book, Culture Metabolism, way back when, and said, you know, I was a violent criminal all my life. And I realized, you know, I, I, that when I changed my diet after reading this book in prison, I don't know how he did that, that he realized he was a very different person. And they've done prison studies where they pe- pe- prisoners healthy diets and they reduce violent crime by 56 percent if you have a multivitamin it reduces crime by 80 percent well you can in just, prisons yeah you can just see that the, the notion that we you know we don't approach that right what is criminal activity and violence so some of it's stuff we don't understand some of it's certainly horrible character pathology uh, but some of it when we think that this is a population that in general does not have good nourishment no. in general um you know does not learn a lot of mental health skills mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's there's a way that that some of what's going on there is certainly just a result of a broken system of mental health care, and and I would say a broken system of our culture. I've been really uh, I've been inspired this month by Benjamin uh, the Benjamin Rush biography, and the reason is that I didn't know anything about Benjamin Rush, and Benjamin Rush is one of our youngest founding fathers. He is, is I think, the second youngest signer of the Declaration of Independence, and the only I think one I think the only physician signer. Yeah. And he is our original American physician. They called him uh, the American Hippocrates back in the day. And he's also our original psychiatrist. And he founded the first mental hospital. And he helped us found this country on a very, very simple principle, which is that when we think about mental illness, we can't put people in asylums and say that they don't have spirituality or they're sinners or they're bad people, that we as physicians are going to treat them as patients and we are going to care for them. And that has just inspired me to really think mm. about what's happening in our country and how bad our mental health has got and how we all know about it. And we're just finally starting to talk about it. Uh-huh. But we were, we were founded as a place where we should have freedom to talk about this. Yeah. I'll get you a copy of the Benjamin Rush. Yeah, it sounds it's fantastic. Like every well, I mean, doctor that, should read it. So, so, so Drew, uh, you wrote this paper it was published September, 2018 in um, the psychiatric journal. And, and it was really quite detailed in terms of its analysis of the types of foods and nutrients. So help us take this home. What are the things that you learned from there that are the most important nutrients we need? And what are the most important foods to help us get those nutrients and just in general to help us for sure for mental illness? And so the simple, the, the paper is called antidepressants foods and, and folks can and check it out. And it's an open source article. And, and I did this with my colleague, Dr. Laura Lachance and quite simply it's, it's arithmetic. It's bean counting. And we went through all of the literature, looking at all of the, the essential nutrients, uh, vitamins and minerals and did a literature search to say, well, well, which of these have significant evidence that they can help prevent depression and that they can be used to treat depression? And there are 12 that we found. And, and I bet you could name all 12, Mark. I mean, they're, they're the 12 we would expect, omega-3 fats and zinc and B12, vitamin E, magnesium. Iron. And then iron. And so then we looked at uh, just a simple, what a nutrient profiling system is, is it just tries, to, it, it's just a, a system for looking at what foods have the most of those nutrients per calorie. And then what a good nutrient profiling system does, and Dr. Lachance and I really wanted to create a good one because oddly there are, I think, 27 nutrient profiling systems in the world that have been created. Some people have seen ones like the Andy or Nuval. You know how many have been about mental health? None. None. And so what we, a good nutrient uh, traveling system does looks at food categories. So we're not saying kale, 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 kale. And people say, well, I don't like kale. Can't eat too much of it. You don't know. Exactly. Oh, no, it's toxic now. Now it's toxic work. Uh, 
but what we say is leafy greens. And so what we did is we scored, um, uh, we looked at all of the uh, all of the the top foods for these nutrients, scored them, and then created a list of the top plant and animal foods. And so they're they're you know first of all they're the foods that top the list, which I just think are are interesting. Like oysters, clams, and mussels are in the top five on the animal side. And the reason okay. we did animal foods is that no nutrient profiling system usually has any meat or any animals in it because it's all based on calories usually and plants always have fewer calories but most people eat meat or seafood so we wanted to give folks a list of yeah. which which had the most nutrients and why why were this shellfish the top ones top ones because think about uh, oysters why do they top the list you get 10 to 15 calories per oyster so let's just say you know six oysters 60 calories and for those 60 calories you're getting 768 milligrams of long chain omega-3 fats you're getting 340 percent of your vitamin b12 you're getting uh gosh at least a third of your iron you're getting 500 percent of your daily need of zinc you're i mean and on and on and on you're getting even some vitamin c in oysters okay and, let's go get some oysters yeah <laughs> exactly all that for 60 calories and that's just and on the other side looking at plants like things like watercress top the list mm -hmm. and why just watercress lots of nutrients no calories or very few calories and so that's a great example of nutrient density those foods and so the food categories that people should be looking for are things like leafy greens the rainbow vegetables more seafood and if you're eating meat and red meat to look more towards wild red meats or grass-fed red meats mm -hmm. So this is fascinating. So the diet that prevents cancer, heart disease, dementia, depression, and fixes most chronic illness is the same diet. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's, well, it's where we got off in medicine. We kind of separated out mental health and brain health from the rest. Like, like you're saying, kind of like somehow the blood brain, brain barrier was like, thou shall not pass. Like we, we didn't think that, sure, those same all the same activities that we, we, we think about in terms of our general health and the foods we want people to eat and the things we want people to do, move their bodies, uh, connect, be part of their community. Yeah, that, that's key to your brain health and your mental health. Yeah. And, it, and the trouble with you know, our food supply is that it's often depleted. Even if you're eating the best foods, you, know, you have an organic farm. The soil matters in terms really, of what's in the food. Yeah. And if you're growing on depleted soils, uh, which most of our soils are more like dust and dirt. Well, they're just like and chemicals in, chemicals out. I mean, it, it's really, you know, if you, if you, if you grow, live, you know, if you, if you live by the foods you grow, uh, you don't, you know, you don't do it the way that a lot of food is grown. And even, you know, even organic food, it's funny as you, as you drive through the produce belt, and I encourage people to do this. And you look out, you know, you'll see organic stuff out there. Yeah. But it doesn't look like a it doesn't look like a healthy farm somehow. It's got a lot of food on it, but it doesn't smell right. The people working it, they they I don't know, they don't seem happy in a certain way. The the it, it's it's because of their big monocrop organic yeah, farms. Yeah, it's big, big monoculture. Yeah, you know, you look at a big till the soil, which yeah. doesn't produce great soil. They they there's a ton of tillage. There's a ton of diesel spent. There's a ton of compaction. And, yeah. And and it's a real, I think it's a challenge right now. Because industrial organic is what Michael Pollan calls it. It is, yeah. and 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 in a lot of ways, you know, that's been a huge victory because mm -hmm. we have a conversation better. about organic, right? It's yeah. better than and the organic it, was just found to reduce cancer by twenty five percent. People who had it, this French study, right? I mean, yeah. it is, it, yeah. it, so there's you know there there's something there. So it's a step in the right direction. But when you think about uh, where I'm from, and you drive around, we. We, our soil is pretty rough in Crawford County, but boy, you want to, I would say that a lot of places, Mark, where we live, if you'd take a lot of Americans, they wouldn't know they were in America because it's just that whole central notion, that Central America or Middle American notion of a small farm and what that looks like and how that functions. Some cows, a couple of pigs, not a monoculture, uh, a nice garden, for all your food and for sharing with your neighbors, that has died in a way. Yeah. And and I, I think that Wayne Berry calls it the unsettling of America. Yeah, and I think that we, you know maybe dead is not that's on life support, and and maybe we're seeing a shift now. I, it I seems like it's coming back. Shift. There's more smallholder farms. I hope so. I mean, it's definitely coming back. You see it. You see it on the coasts, and you see it around urban centers. But there, there's still a lot of places that don't. Um, I, you know where it's not uh it's not happening that mm -hmm. that kind of combo of um uh, you know 
uh, I would say agritourism and interest in food, but also just interest in farms. But I'm, mm-hmm. I'm hopeful. I've, so, so, so my question was going down the path of, okay, if, if our, even organic isn't the best that it could be, if the foods have been bred in a way to create more starch, who are, a lot of the phytochemicals have been bred out of it, the nutrients aren't there because of the soil, even if it's the best organic farm. Uh, and by the way, Dan Barber and, um, uh, and Walter Robb, a former CEO of Whole Foods, or create a seed company to actually reinvent new seeds mm-hmm. to to breed them, so they have flavor and they have nutrient density and they are phytochemical rich. It's a very different idea than breeding them for yield or for pest resistance or water or, or drought. But they're doing all that too. But they're they're doing both. So the question is, if that's true, then do we need supplements? And do you use supplement nutritional supplements in your practice to treat mood disorders? So. I think even with the food we have today, you can still get all the nutrients you need. It's actually challenging. If you look at all the recommended daily allowance and you think what you would need to eat to meet that, yeah. it's a little challenging. Yeah. It requires some thinking about it. I oh always God, yeah. t- tell people, no, just eat nutrient-dense food, you'll, you'll be fine. But if you start scratching your head and, and adding it up, it can be tough. Yeah, I, and I, had, I, just to stop, I had a patient once who was like, I don't want to take supplements. So I literally looked every food up, and I'm like, okay, selenium, it's in Brazil. So I have two Brazil nuts a day. <laughs> like that, I have yeah. 17 pumpkin <laughs> right, seeds. Exactly. I have, you know, two <laughs> cups of, you know, yeah. broccoli or whatever it is. Right. And I was like, okay, fine. If you want to do that, go ahead. <laughs> Let's check your nutrient levels. Well, I have that problem where I, I don't like the idea of turning a meal into a math equation. And so yeah. I myself, I mean, I'm, I'm 44, and I, I stopped taking all supplements probably about, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I guess that's not entirely true. I'll take I'll take a little omega-3 sometimes, and certainly in my practice for non-seafood eaters or for individuals who are just kind of eating seafood every now and then, especially for individuals who don't want to try uh, you know, a medicine and they've never, and even for individuals who do, I'll put them on a one to two gram milligram uh, grams of fish oil. I mean, in the trials that, that you know, the con- fish oil is, is very, in the science, in the sort of studies of depression is one of these things that has statistical significance, but it's not able to show clinical significance in the meta-analyses mm-hmm. that you get about a point reduction on a, you know, Hamilton D uh, depression rating scale. Mm-hmm. That said, uh, well, you can't take fish oil and be eating like processed yeah, oils, exactly. which displace, displace it. Exactly. And you can't be eating piles of sugar. I'm just like, yeah. you that, know. It, it, that, you know, and you wonder a lot this of these the way trials, the studies are designed. Well, you right? wonder, one, do they control for that? And two, you know, we have all these SNPs now in the elongase genes in terms of how we process omega-3 fats. Those are genetic variations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that. There's also, the, you know, if you have somebody who's a seafood eater versus not. But the... the um, the bottom line is, I think that there are certain supplements uh, that that should be tried, especially when people are struggling with traditional uh, like antidepressant response. Like a lot of people, I'll see they'll have been on a medicine; it works some, like with mm-hmm. cheerfulness or with sleep, but they're not eating well, and for whatever reason, they're not going to start eating well. So that's a really good example of somebody who a multivitamin or something with zinc or magnesium. Um, certainly, anybody who's low. I mean, I always have that feeling like if you're low. I definitely want to get your, do you test your patients. Yeah, yeah. I test. I, I don't do as extreme or not even extreme, maybe as thorough, but I certainly test everybody. I mean, I think what you were saying earlier, I think any mental health clinician who misses, I mean, it is malpractice. Yeah. If you miss a thyroid problem, yeah. a B12 deficiency, yeah. syphilis, I mean, there's a bunch of biological causes of depression. Yeah. And I think you and I see that get missed sometimes oh, where yeah. it's like, this is, not, this is not even functional medicine. This is just. Basic, basic medicine, medicine. Yeah, yeah. No, it's all good medicine yeah it's good medicine i mean i i you know in my practice i see the common deficiencies you're testing are vitamin d yep. magnesium omega-3 fats sometimes iron yep and the b vitamins particularly around homocysteine and methylation issues which is this cycle of folate b12 and b6 and so i find that giving people a multi and fish oil and vitamin d and maybe a little magnesium usually has enormous impact and well, you think it's that even if you're going to get them to change their food right away, there's some, you know, that, that takes a little bit. In, in, but I even we're changing the food, I, I, feel, I feel like we're so depleted. It's just. Yeah, well, it's hard. And it's also, it's really hard when you're depressed. Yeah. You know, so, so I think what, what uh, it also gives people something <laughs> to do. Yeah, because you do. I mean, depression causes a lot of carbohydrate craving and a lot of, you know, we eat, we call it comfort food for a reason because we eat it when we want to be comforted. Right. I mean, I know when I'm in that bad spot, man. I'm I'm a mac and cheese guy. Yeah, and like, gives you a little serotonin. Yeah, don't give boost, me right. don't give me any talk about carbs. I need like right. my comfort food. But yeah, it's yeah. um, 
I, I think it's something else. The other one that's I think exciting is the L methylfolate. It's just exciting in the idea that Which we're, is actually a prescription drug for depression. Well it's, it's called a, Deplin, but yeah, it's like it's a B it's a B vitamin right, that got you surfed real. by Am I allowed to say that? It's a B vitamin that got usurped by Big Pharma is the way yeah. I think about it, which is yeah. you have L-methylfolate, which is folate that has a methyl group added onto it. And instead of that being five bucks, it's 200 bucks. Yeah, but, but you can get it for five bucks. You can, you can get it. For, but the idea that we're just now, because this is going to be the next frontier mark, as you know, which is we're going to start really getting into precision psychiatry. I mean, that's my most, my favorite new center at Columbia is the Center for Precision Psychiatry. There is that? There's, there's a Center for Precision Psychiatry. There's a Center for Practice Innovation. There's a Center for Women's Mental Health. I mean, Amazing. we, there's, there's going to be, a, there's a new center for media and mental health that's coming wow. online. And precision psychiatry is just that, which is, there's no, I mean, one of the things I think it's interesting is there's nobody that's more critical of psychiatry than our, like, than ourselves. Yeah. Because nobody sits with the, like, and sees the failure. <laughs> well, nobody sits with it, like, you know, in, in, until you sit with getting an antidepressant prescription wrong and, and then getting it right and knowing that somebody suffered because you didn't make the right choice. It, it, when you sit with that, you want to get it right more than anybody else yeah. because that's, that's your job. And so it's an exciting time between the new knowledge of the microbiome, the psychiatric genetics, which it's not there yet, but man, it's getting close. It, we're, we're, I hope, going to see the tide turn on our methyl, mental health epidemic. We are going to see the tide turn on our mm. mental health epidemic, Mark. Yeah. We won't rest until it does. Deal? No, no, we can. No, it's, 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 I mean, it's the food, stupid, as you know, to paraphrase a former president, but it's like, it's, it's, people don't get how powerful it is and how impactful and how quick it works. How do you get people to see it though? Because I feel like when we tell people, hey, eat right, feel right, they, they get that. When we say, you know, food, you know what I food. do? I, I, I just, I think, you know, often incrementalism doesn't work because people don't see a change. So people are eating a crappy diet. So just stop the soda, but they're eating like garbage. Right. They're not going to feel better, right? So I put people usually for, I said, 10 days, you can do anything. So I put them on a, basically an elimination diet. I call it the 10-day detox diet mm -hmm. for 10 days. And they can experience, without me telling them, the changes that happen in their body, in their brain, in their mood, their energy, their sleep. And it's quick. So you usually can get people to do anything for 10 days. And then... They go, oh, okay. Well, well, they have to. I mean, I think you, you, any good behavioral change, it's like, yeah. we, we can't tell you. You can't read about it. Mm -hmm. The study's not going to help. The mm -hmm. sound bite, the science. Like, you have to experience it working. And as soon as you experience that, that extra energy, yeah. that, that better, what I find, fact, the better sleep quality. Yeah. Where, you know, I'm expecting to hear like more mood, more energy. And people are like, you know, doc, but I'm, I'm really sleeping better. Yeah. And all yeah. those ways that, you know, that, like that yeah. then makes you know, nothing affects mood, I would say, like sleep. I would say the, the smartest doctor in the room is your own body. Like you have to yeah. see what affects you, which foods make you feel good, make you feel bad, which foods actually make you gain weight or lose weight and, and pay attention because smarter than any lab test or doctor is your own body's response to the food you're eating. And I think if wow. it's not working, then you have to say, well, why is it not working? And what do I do? And I think your book really outlines a different way of thinking that is really at the key to not just solving weight and obesity, Gary, it's at the key to solving most of our global issues because yeah. food and the food we're eating is 60% ultra processed food, mostly refined starchy carbohydrates. It's driving this pandemic of obesity. It's also driving the pandemic of chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, and more. It's literally killing 11 million people a year around the world. I and mean, we think COVID is bad, but there's far more people that die every day from eating the wrong food than from, from uh, COVID or any, any other disease combined. And it's all related to this underlying mechanism of high levels of insulin sustained over a lifetime that drives aging. It's, it's really the, the fundamental mechanism of aging and reversing it is the right. fundamental strategy to longevity, well-being, weight loss, to all the solving of all of our chronic problems and all their downstream consequences of, ob of, of the economic impact, of climate change, of social injustice. So many, so many things are connected to this. And I think, you, you know, if you hit on this key idea that we need to get rid of these starchy, refined calories that are causing high insulin, we, we literally uh, pull the thread that's connecting everything that will literally unravel our current uh, metabolic, economic, and environmental catastrophe. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I mean, again, it's, it's um, I mean, there are huge issues to doing this because again, what does the food industry produce, which are exactly the foods that we're going after? 
um, and saying people can't. I mean, I had to go to the, I dropped my son off the school bus, thank God, this morning at seven in the morning. And I stopped off at Safeway to, uh, to pick up some butter. And um, I'm walking down this aisle and I want to call it the diabetes aisle, right? It starts with yeah. this, it, it, not the sports <laughs> drink. It starts with the, you know, the high caffeine, uh, high sugar drinks on the left. And it's got the chips <laughs> right on the right and the chips on the left. And then I move down to the sodas and then I go to the sports drinks and the chips go to the, you know, from potato chips. to the. I love the, it. I yeah, mean, you just, can have a cancer aisle, a heart disease aisle, a dementia yeah. aisle, a diabetes aisle. That would be great. Seriously. <laughs> it was like. I love um, that. And that's the thing. The world doesn't have to go keto. One of the things that runs in that the keto, uh, the low carb movement has run into lately is uh, the, the idea that livestock is bad for the environment. Um, the livestock, uh, uh, the significant producer of, of greenhouse gases, and I don't know enough about this science to comment. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to assume that it's, you know, for sake of argument that this is true and it's a problem and it's got to be dealt with. But the underlying assumption is that if we all go plant-based, we'll all be healthier. The phrase used by this uh, Eat Lancet commission that was headed by Walter Willett and has, uh, at Harvard and has made such inroads into you know pushing this plant-based movement for everyone is uh, it's a win-win situation. You know we know that if we eat plant-based diet, we will be healthier. We know if we eat a plant-based diet, the climate, the world will be healthier. And the, again, the point is, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the lean people of the world, they can eat a plant-based diet. They're fine. All of us can improve our diet and be healthier by getting rid of, you know, the refined sugar and the, the stuff in the diabetes aisle, the supermarket. Um, yeah. All of us will be healthier, but some of us have to go further. We just have yeah. to, we have to cut out carbs and then plant-based foods come with carbs attached. That's, that's yeah. the name with the it, exception it, of olives and avocados. That's, you yeah. know. And if anybody wants um, to dig into the whole meat, no meat, uh, you know, climate change, uh, health, so forth issues, I, I, we've done a lot of podcasts on this. But the short answer is it's not the cow, it's the how. Uh, and, and if you grow factory farmed animals, yes, they're a, a, an abomination. They should be outlawed and they're devastating human health, environmental health, animal welfare uh, and mm -hmm. destroying our soils and polluting our waters and poisoning right. us with chemicals. So that, that there's no doubt about that or disagreement. However, uh, there's a movement of regenerative agriculture, which uh, has the hypothesis that you can actually raise animals in an integrated ecosystem of a farm that builds soil, that conserves water, that eliminates the need for chemicals, that produces healthier food, more food, more profitable for the farmers, and actually maybe uh, healthy. Uh, in fact, uh, some guys like Fred Provenza, I don't know if you've heard this research, uh, Gary, but Fred Provenza is a rangeland scientist from University of Utah, or Utah State, who's now working with folks at Duke and finding that, that uh, animals that are allowed to forage on a wide variety of plant foods actually uptake all these phytochemicals and have much different nutrient profiles, much different metabolic profiles when you eat them. Uh, the one favorite study I always quote is the kangaroo study in Australia, because you can get kangaroo meat there. And they fed them, you know, gram per gram protein, the same amount of feedlot beef for kangaroo meat. And uh, the feedlot a group had increased inflammatory biomarkers and the kangaroo eaters uh, actually got better. They were healthier. They had lower inflammation as a result. And this is, you know, taking a chunk of meat, exactly the same amount and feeding right, them right, right. based on where, what they ate. So I think, I think uh, this is a different topic, but, and I don't think a ketogenic diet is a high meat diet either. It's not necessarily a high meat diet. It doesn't it have is. to be. Yeah. It's, and, yeah. Exactly. And, and I think some people can tolerate some level of whole grains or beans. Some people can't. And some, you know, and often the argument is, well, you know, uh, when I when I switched to vegan, I lost weight, I got healthy. And I think if you're eating the standard American diet, the absolute answer is yes, you will be much better off if you switch to a lot of plants and whole foods and get off all the crap. And it may not be the vegan diet; it may be just getting off the crap. And then the question is, long term, what happens to these people? And and if you start looking at a lot of these situations you see you see this increasing creeping insulin even if you're eating you know whole grains and beans some people are just that carbohydrate intolerant so i think right. there's a continuum we have to understand and i think that's what you're saying with your book it's not just one size fits all everybody in the world should be keto because it, i don't think that's true you're talking about the spectrum of eating styles depending on your metabolic 
type and, and your response to the food you're eating. Right. And that's it. So we're, we're cutting carbs and we're, we're adding fat mm. at some level. And if you prefer animal protein and animal fat and you can make it work, I, my favorite part of the book. So at the end of the book, I have, um, lessons that I've learned from the physicians I've interviewed. And I think, you know, I sort of encapsulated the key lessons in how to think about progressing to a, a low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. And so, um, Carrie Doulis, I'm sure you know Carrie, because she's Cleveland and formerly mm -hmm. Cleveland Clinic. So Carrie's a, a, a spine surgeon formerly at the Cleveland Clinic, now private practice in, the, in Ohio. And she uh, comes from a family history of obesity. She had a weight problem. She said she, she was 300 weight. pounds. She was 300, 300 pounds. pounds. Yeah. She's and then she got, also has type 1 diabetes. And she can't tolerate animal products. She just can't do it. Her body can't do it. So she has moved to eating a vegan ketogenic diet. And she said to me, and this is the quote that I lead off the section with, it's not a religion. It's just about how I feel. Right. And that's the thing we're all doing. It's about how we feel. And that's, again, it's part of learning the learning process and learning how to do these experiments. I mean, you and I probably do it naturally. It's like some issue comes up in your life. My wife always gets, she's been living with this for far too long, but, um, you know, I'll make some comment about how I feel and I go, I can't understand it. And she says, you always said that. And I go, well, what I can't understand is why I feel like this today. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand it in terms of what I <laughs> ate yesterday or the day before yeah. that, because I think yeah. it's related. And can I change my diet in such a way that I don't feel like I do today in the future? And what do I have to do, you know, and, and, and over the course of you know, among the vices we talked about before we got started, all the vices we've given up, part of the reason we've given up these vices is because they don't make us feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, I no longer drink alcohol, not because I have any uh, moral, ethical issues with alcohol, but quite the contrary. It's just the next day I tend to feel like crying all day long. Oh, and, uh, Gary, I'll give you a yeah. hug. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. So, you know, a hangover you could fix with aspirin. Depression, you can't. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, eventually, uh, slowly over the years, it's become no, but because I'm paying attention yeah. to how I feel the next day, and in my case, it's so it's it doesn't need a lot of attention to be paid to notice it. But th these are the kind of things you can do with all issues of your diet. Well, you're you know, right. If I start adding beans back to my diet and I gain 10 pounds and I find that I'm craving beans, black beans doesn't matter, healthy beans, just like they might eat in a blue zone. But when mm -hmm. I add it back to my diet, I, I gain weight and I don't like the weight and I don't like the fact that I'm now craving the beans. Maybe it's better mm -hmm. than I don't eat them. Yeah. They're bad for me. They might be fine for David Katz or Mark Bittman. That's right. That's but they're right. not fine That's for right. me. That's right. That's, that's right. We're all, that's we're all different. We're trying. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think we, uh, we have this amazing opportunity now to start to teach people about personalized nutrition and, and food as medicine. And I think one of the things that, that people don't understand, and you, you sort of highlight this with what you said, I think it's important for people to really get this. Most people don't connect what they eat with how they feel. Right. And, and food is the single biggest modifier of your biology every day there is nothing right. that influences your biology in terms of hormones the microbiome your immune system your detoxification system your brain chemistry your metabolism i mean there's nothing besides food that has that impact and when you when you the underlying subtext of what you're saying and, and that we talk about in functional medicine is that food isn't just calories it's information it's instructions that regulate your biology mm -hmm. with every bite and can and can turn on or off hormones, genes, and and uh, immune function it, it, literally in minutes. And I I think most people, if they started to pay attention, like you did, when I drink alcohol, I cry the next day, or when I eat a bagel, hmm, I don't feel good, or I take a nap. I mean, <laughs> I went to visit some friends over on, on Maui, and and I went to visit some friends on the other side of the island who are pretty much vegetarian, vegan. And they had lunch and, and I, I'll eat anything like I'm not right. I'm not uh, religious and I, I normally don't eat a lot of beans or grains. I, I don't have a thing against them. I just feel better without them. And, and she had a big bowl of grains and beans for lunch. And then I, I literally that afternoon we went down to the, the ocean. There was this where this place, the river comes to the ocean. There's like really like rocky, rocky beach. And I literally was in a food coma. I literally laid down on my stomach 
it was like on a bed of nails, like on this really uncomfortable, like rocky thing with like rocks sticking everywhere in my body. And I literally fell asleep <laughs> with these rocks sticking in me because I was in this coma <laughs> from what I had for lunch. Now, that's not the true for everybody. But for me, that was true. And I think it just I well, just this is think, <laughs> you know, part of my part of my conversion experience. Right. As I used to say back. You know, prior to 2000, I didn't take naps. Naps took me. So I'm a science journalist. I would be interviewing some Nobel Prize winner over the phone at two in the afternoon at lunch, and I would have to get off the phone before I fell asleep. I would have to think up some excuse. Um, I have I used to have notebooks back in the days when we would take notes on the notebooks. And then they would like I'd go back to look at them and my my pen would just fall off the page because I'd have fallen asleep while I was taking notes. Um yeah, I gave up carbs that stopped. Actually, one of the things that triggered this is I was doing the first piece I ever did on dietary fat for science. I was interviewing a guy at Yale who's an authority on carbohydrate metabolism. And I said to him, why is it I fall asleep every afternoon after lunch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, religiously? And uh, and he said, well, we don't know. He's like, how could you not know that? I mean, it's, it's such a profound phenomenon. There's whole cultures that have siestas in the afternoons because they have <laughs> carb-rich lunches. And, and wine. And then they, and they, wine. They, 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 wine, <laughs> and then wine. they go to sleep. Anyway, and then you give up the carbs. It just stops happening. I often wonder, you know, we get a message nowadays we should all sleep eight hours a night. It's vitally important. We'll control our weight better if we do it. We'll control our blood sugar better if we do it. But one of the things that happened when I... I cut out sugar, starches, and grains, I stop needing to sleep as much. I can get by on five, six hours of sleep, and I constantly have the struggle that I should be sleeping more. And yet, well, if I sleep more, it. I'm actually less alert. So it's yeah, sort of, need it. again, individual variation and being aware of your body because we don't need a clinical trial. And this is the point I make in the book. We're taught, well, you don't know if these, and again, people, we don't have enough clinical trials to know if this is good for you. Well, you don't have, we do have the 100 plus completed clinical trials of ketogenic diets, and it's undeniably, you know, beneficial over the course of at least a couple of years. And then it's hard to imagine that somehow it all goes bad the longer you yeah. do. But people who don't like this message can imagine anything. So I'm not going to, but you don't need a clinical trial to tell you if this will change your ability to control your weight and blood sugar. Yeah. Particularly the weight. It's just, just do it. Yeah. But do it, it right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think how, um, I'd love you to sort of share some of the clinical trials that have been recently done around diabetes. Cause I think the data is so striking, uh, that it, it's really worth talking about because we are now facing a, a pandemic of obesity and diabetes. In fact, one out of two Americans is pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic. It's the number one driver of our uh, economic costs within Medicare, which is, you know, if, if Medicare was a company, it would be the biggest corporation in the world with a budget of over $1.3 trillion a year. And it's it's a good third of that and probably more if you include pre-diabetes. So um, Talk about what we've learned from these rigorous clinical trials using ketogenic diets on type 2 diabetics who are actually on insulin, on medications, severely overweight, and how it compares to sort of other trials and treatments for diabetes. Well, the story with diabetes has always been the same. Is it the carbs or is it the calories? Okay, this is the recurring theme going back to 1913. The um, so today you do a clinical trial. So the conventional wisdom, the ADA tells uh, their doctors just tell the patients to keep eating however many carbohydrates they're eating. We don't want to disturb them. We don't want to give them any advice they can't follow. And then we can cover that with insulin. And the insulins we have are so fancy and so exotic these days, so uh, high tech that that this won't be a problem. Except then when they look at the um, uh, you know population wide. Uh, insulin control, you find out that it's actually worse than it's ever been. So both type one and type two diabetics are doing bad jobs at controlling their insulin, um, at controlling their uh, blood sugar. So now you put them on a, a ketogenic diet. And the best study we have is Verda. And it's criticized because it's not a randomized controlled trial, but you don't actually need a randomized controlled trial for a chronic degenerative condition that never gets better because people serve as their own controls. 
So they have smartphones and uh, telemedicine and they prescribe uh, well-formulated uh, nutritional ketosis, ketogenic diets. And uh, over the course of five years, they have, uh, they, I think their five-year data is now available in abstract form. They have tremendous uh, maintenance of the diet and uh, virtually all of the people who are on insulin get off insulin and they, most of the people get off their oral medications and they lose weight even when they're not trying to lose weight. This isn't prescribed as a weight loss diet and they get healthier and they sustain it because they're sustaining their health. On the flip side, you've got a trial in England that got a lot of uh, uh, attention where you put people on, uh, I think it was 600 calorie a day, semi-starvation diets. They're all, it's even more than semi-starvation. That also will lower insulin levels and will put the diabetes into permission. But now you have a problem with what do you do when the people go back to eating the way they used to. Yeah, because you can't eat 600 calories your whole life. You can't stay on 600 calories your whole life. So, and one of my issues with the nutrition, diabetes, and obesity research community to begin with is they just keep reiterating the same thing. Like a sign that a science is pathological is they keep saying the same thing over and over again, doing the same experiments over and over again, and they never make progress. And so what we know from these trials is you you know, you advocate abstinence from sugars, grains, and starches, and and you know beans, and people get healthy. They'll get off the you know, the type two diabetes are going to remission, and they knew that pre-insulin, as you said, it, the pre-insulin was known as the animal diet, and uh, type two diabetics. We didn't use the, that terminology back then, but the physicians in the 19th century knew that that older people got their diabetes older and heavier, had a more uh, 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 less acute chronic form of the disease, and they could put it into remission and basically live, uh, you know, perfectly healthy lives so long as they didn't eat carbohydrates. Yeah. You know, don't that, eat the foods that you can't tolerate. It's yeah. how difficult is that? I and mean, what struck me was the Verta trials, which essentially is a, as an online digital disruptive healthcare delivery system using coaches and high touch points with pretty advanced diabetics uh, and, and our friend Sarah Halberg and others, and this is just some of the data you're talking about, uh, were able to see within a year, two years, a 60% reversal, not just, not just uh, improvement, but reversal of diabetes with normalization of glucose, lipids, A1C without medication, a 90 plus percent reduction in, in medic insulin, 100 percent elimination of some of the key diabetes medications and, and a 12 percent weight loss, which may not sound like a lot to people. But if we see a 5 percent weight loss in a weight loss trial, that's dramatic. Uh, the results seem to be sustained at two and even longer now years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did a follow-up study looking at all the biomarkers around heart disease, which was fascinating. So the, the concern that people have is, oh, my God, if I eat fat, what about my cholesterol? You know, cholesterol is causing heart disease. It's going to get bad. And can you talk about, uh, you know, how, how you would address these, these uh, concerns about eating a high-fat diet and lipids and heart disease and what this trial showed? that, that um, was the impact on lipid profiles. Well, and this is, you know, the, the issue with LDL cholesterol has always been the problem with these low carb, high fat diets. Even when I was doing my first piece for science, one of the research I interviewed was a guy named Pete Ahrens at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. And Ahrens was the, probably the best scientist in the field in the 1950s, 1960s. And he told me the story of a, a young woman, a Broadway actress who came to see him. She had gone on Atkins to keep her weight under control. And, you know, her cholesterol went up to 600. Uh. Right? You have to get her off the diet because the diet's going to kill her. That's the idea. So you, there are a lot of people we eat this high fat, high saturated fat diet. They're the phrase now thrown around the community is that they're hyper responders and their LDL cholesterol goes up or their LDL particle number goes up. Yeah. The good news is it used to be that would happen. The doctor would, you know, say you're going to kill yourself. You can't eat this way anymore. Now uh, an improvement, they'll say, well, look, since you've dropped 50 pounds and your A1C has come down from like 10 to six and we've gotten you off your medications, maybe you should continue to eat this way, but let's, monitor the cholesterol or let's put you on some you know low dose statin to try and control right. the cholesterol and everyone feels differently about statins and i'm not gonna i don't know what to think because i have friends i respect <laughs> on all sides of this 
Um, for the most part, uh, the Verda study showed us, and these are in people who really are metabolically disturbed and that they have type 2 diabetes. They yeah. looked at 26 risk factors for heart disease. 26 of them, 22 of them improved on the improved. nutritional improved. ketosis. 22 got better. Three stayed the same. And LDL cholesterol occasionally got worse. And of course, you know. Sometimes it can get better too. Sometimes it can get better. And the cosmic joke, right, is that LDL is the only thing that conventional medical establishment, cardiology community has paid attention to. But and then when they look at overall risk factor, you could do an overall risk factor assessment from these numbers, and it clearly got better. And that's with these people getting off drugs. So the comparison are, you know, diabetics who are getting standard of care diabetic therapy at Indiana. And so, um, you know, I talk about in the book, I just talk about my own experience. My LDL was fine for about a decade on this diet. And then the last time it was measured, it, well, it got higher the one time it got measured, not just LDL cholesterol, but LDL particle number, which mm -hmm. is a much better predictor of risk. Um, still not as good as HDL over triglycerides, which always improves on this diet or total cholesterol over HDL, which always improves when you eat this way. Yeah. But they're almost always nothing's universal. Um, well, it's, you know, powerful. I, it's powerful. It's powerful. When, when you, when you, and again, it's really like I, I just recall a patient who I had who was a woman struggling with weight loss for years. Her total cholesterol was over 300. Her triglycerides were well over 300. Her HDL was yeah. terrible, like 30 something. Uh, her blood sugar was high. Her insulin was high. She had small particle. I mean, she had the worst metabolic yeah. profile. And I said, listen, eat coconut oil and butter and get off of all the starch and let's see what happens. Just, I don't know. Let's try it. Six months, six weeks, two months. There's no harm in a short term trial. And then right. I, you know, then I, I measure, right? Trust, but verify, right? As Reagan right, said. Right, right, right. And then I checked her lab tests. Her cholesterol dropped a hundred points. Her LDL dropped like almost that. Her HDL went up 25 points. Her triglycerides dropped 200 points. I was like, and she lost 20 pounds. Another guy was a, a skinny little biker who wanted to try keto for performance and athleticism. Right. Uh, and, he, you know, he was in his 50s and he just, you know, was biking four hours a day and just doing all this. And his numbers just went through the roof. So it just. Just it, LDL, though, I assume. No, not the his uh, whole his particle them. number, his small particles. Yeah. I mean, everything yeah, went yeah, yeah, haywire. Yeah. And I noticed the same thing for me. I'm a, I'm one of those lean mass hyper responders. I probably shouldn't announce that because people will send me all kinds of hate mail or hate messages on social media. But, you know, if, if I, uh, if I, uh, you know, don't eat a little bit of carbohydrate, like a sweet potato or winter squash, um, I, I, I will tend to lose too much weight, but also my lipids will go crazy if I'm if I'm eating just too much saturated fat. So I, I can modify it. I can eat more avocados and more olive oil right. and more nuts and seeds and other different fats. You know, even yeah, I, then, the the assumption is always that what you're doing is going to make a significant difference in your long term health. And this is the issue that uh, yeah. Again, I discuss in the book. Um, We've been taught to whenever you're doing preventive medicine, right? You're 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 it's hypothesis based medicine. If I get you to do this, or I add the uh, this the little bit of sweet potato winter squash back, and I get my LDL down, I'm going to minimize my risk of heart disease, and I'm going to live longer. And this is a probabilistic assessment. Doesn't mean you're not going to have a heart attack. You're just going to lower the chance of having a heart attack. And the flip side is, if I get you to eat the coconut oil and the butter. <laughs> and get rid of the carbs, I can watch you get healthier. So not only yes. will your lipid profiles get better, but I could literally watch you get healthier. I could watch your weight come down and your sleep disturbances improve and your mood will improve and your energy yeah. will improve. And you know, you'll walk in the office three months from now, and this is why people like us can sound a little quackish and you'll be a different person. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? And you know, your book, your book is such a brilliant analysis of the science, but it's also got a lot of practical aspects it call the yeah. plan where you go through a number of principles of how to think about doing this, how to work with a doctor and how to get started. So it's not just sort of an abstract, theoretical, historical analysis. It's actually very practical. And I, I really encourage people to get a copy of the case for keto, rethinking weight control and the science and practice of low carb 
high fat eating because uh, if you are one of those people who are metabolically unhealthy, the 88% of us, uh, it's now more important than ever to really get this right and get your insulin down because COVID-19 disproportionately affects those who have poor metabolic health, uh, including obesity, overweight, prediabetes, diabetes, and chronic disease, which is all connected to insulin. And, and Gary, what's exciting is you know, your book focuses on weight, but uh, keto is being researched for cancer, for improving, for example, responses to chemo and radiation, for obviously reversing diabetes, for heart disease, for dementia. It's it's now becoming a standard recommendation. I had well, a patient puts- who was, was at Stanford and they were like, yeah, I mean, I've got uh, Alzheimer's. And they told me to be on a keto diet or brain but- or, or epilepsy or other conditions. This is what's so amazing because the conflict we're up against, you know, we've got U.S. News and World Report. Every year they give their diet ratings and every year they tell us the Mediterranean diet's the healthiest and then the DASH diet, which is supposed to lower your blood pressure. And the, they, they'll look at 35, 40 diets and the worst are always low carb, high fat, ketogenic diets, always the least healthy around. And yet, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is the website that the government has to register clinical trials and just stick in ketogenic as a keyword. Yeah. You'll pull up uh, as of last week, about 250 different trials. A hundred of them have been completed. The others are still in the works. And it's basically, you name a medical condition. Somebody yeah. is testing a ketogenic diet somewhere in the world to see if that will make it better. Yeah, and I use it for heart of- failure patients and the results are amazing. Because it improves yeah. mitochondrial function, and and we didn't really talk about it, but you know your body has two. It's like AC DC. It's like an electric yeah. hybrid uh, Prius, right? It can run on carbs, or run on fat, or run on both. Yeah. But if you if you actually switch to just running on fat, it seems to burn cleaner. It seems to have all these downstream metabolic effects. And and something that we really didn't talk about was aging and and insulin aging. And when you look at the whether it's a ketogenic diet or a high fat low carb diet, or whether it's a a diet that's a uh, intermittent fasting or time restricted eating or any of these kind of approaches, they all do the same thing. They all reduce inflammation, they reduce belly fat, they increase muscle mass, they increase bone density, they improve cognitive function, uh, they improve stem cell production. I mean, they have all these downstream effects that are promoting aging and healthy aging. So this yeah. is really the key to everything. Yeah. Or another way to put it is they're removing the thing that increase that accelerates aging because remember even diabetes is a kind of accelerated aging all these symptoms of aging are basically driven by glucose oxidation the cells you raise blood sugar your body kicks in into uh, overdrive the attempt to like burn it off and you do that you generate reactive oxygen species you generate i mean it's just uh, all the the major manifestations of health of of aging are accelerated by the same foods we're telling people not to eat on these diets nitric oxide prevents inflammation of the arterial wall that will prevent certain blood cells from coming in to deposit cholesterol plaques Mm -hmm. and develop atherosclerosis so and that is why our arteries make nitric oxide we make nitric oxide in order to protect us against hypertension and protect our arteries against inflammation and mm. prevent, prevent unwanted blood clotting, nitric oxide, mm. very potent that way. So if you prevent unwanted blood clotting, you can prevent a stroke. If you prevent inflammation of the arteries, that certainly will go a long way to preventing the development of coronary artery disease, right? Which causes mm. myocardial infarction or heart attack. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's, what's striking is, you know, statins have what we call pleiotropic effects. They have multiple effects. Like they lower cholesterol, they increase nitric oxide, they decrease inflammation through other mechanisms and sure. lower C-reactive protein. That may be the, the real way they work. But what's really fascinating to me is, is this link between nitric oxide and inflammation. Because anybody who's listened to my podcast or understands uh, my work around the, the, the role of food as medicine is that, is that inflammation is the driver of almost all the major chronic diseases we see today. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, autoimmune disease, all these diseases are driven by inflammation. So it seems like nitric oxide could play a big role in in modulating these diseases or influencing diseases. That's exactly correct. Nitric oxide has a pretty powerful anti-inflammatory effects. And the reason is that nitric oxide 
is a free radical, believe it or not. It, it is a free radical, but it's a fairly safe free radical. And what free radicals like to do is to interact and find other free radicals so that they can react covalently and take them out. And that's what nitric oxide does. It is a, an anti-inflammatory because it goes after other radicals, whether it's oxygen radicals like superoxide or, or um, fatty acid radicals, for example, that hang around in membranes. Mm. And by like rancid fat in your arteries, right? Exa exactly. And by neutralizing those free radicals, then by mm. definition, nitric oxide is anti-inflammatory. Actually, we can say that NO is antioxidant, you know, in many cases, believe me, you know, after all the years of research I've been involved with, <laughs> antioxidant and anti-inflammatory are very similar phrases. It's almost yeah. the same thing. Absolutely. It's incredible. So, so let's talk about some of the mechanisms because, you know, uh, what was going on with Viagra was fascinating because it was, it was designed to be a blood pressure drug. And it didn't really work that great, but it had this side effect that the people complained about, or maybe they were celebrating, I don't know. <laughs> and that's what happened. And then this blockbuster category of drugs, which are these, um, these uh, drugs that actually increase nitric oxide. And, and tell us about you know, this, this sort of relationship between blood vessel health, blood pressure, blood organ flow, because really where, where blood goes is where health goes, right? So, uh, Of course, of course. Well, I, I can tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, Viagra and the development, uh, if you like. I mean, as yeah. you said, so when uh, Viagra was first being developed, it was actually tested to see if it could lower the blood pressure in, in humans. And they found that if they raised the concentration high enough, it was still very safe and could lower uh, the blood pressure. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, a side effect was produced. And that is all the male volunteers who were in this study developed an erection, whether they wanted to or not. And uh, appropriately, this was, uh, uh, this was noticed by the nurses who were, running, <laughs> who were running the study. And so, I don't want to hear uh, about that. <laughs> no, no, so I, I, was on, I was on the advisory, scientific advisory board for <laughs> Pfizer uh, for a long time before, a while back. And so what happened was that Pfizer did not want to deal with this. They had no concept then that this could be a useful drug to treat erectile dysfunction. But because of the side effect, they said, listen, we're, we're not going to mess with this. So they stopped developing the drug. They put the drug on the shelf. Then I published my work in 1992 in the New England Journal of Medicine that nitric oxide, because we had shown for the first time, the neurotransmitter released from the nerves that causes penile erection was not known. That's why no drugs could be developed to treat ED. You didn't know what the neurotransmitter was. How can you develop a drug? So we discovered that the neurotransmitter was our good friend, nitric oxide which makes good sense, right? It's a vasodilator. And so they read my work and they realized, oh my goodness, our drug works by increasing nitric oxide. So they filed a new drug application. They took the drug off the shelf. They developed it. The FDA fast-tracked it. <laughs> and in six years, it was marketed as sildenafil or the trade name Viagra. And what's interesting is that Pfizer invited me six months later um, because it was just after the Nobel Prize, invited me to their, to their pharmaceutical uh, company in England where the work was done and showed me the laboratory where this was done. And you could see all my reprints pasted <laughs> on a wall and in the laboratory <laughs> notebooks. It, it, was, it was really great to see this. And from that point on, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but from that point on, I was given the acronym of the father of Viagra. Yeah, <laughs> which, which, which is an acronym I don't mind at all. But my mother was alive at the time, and she used to get very upset whenever very she heard that, and she would tell me, "Why don't you tell them to stop that already?" <laughs> well, I imagine they probably didn't have trouble getting volunteers for that study. I bet. <laughs> so, so that's incredible. So you call it a neurotransmitter, as as well as an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. So it has all these different effects, right? 
It's really amazing. If, when it's released from the nerves, it functions as a neurotransmitter uh, in, in the uh, erectile tissue of men and women, by the way, but it's also a neurotransmitter in the brain where it's released in certain areas of the brain that promote memory, learning, and information recall. Many scientists believe that dementia, especially Alzheimer's disease, may be attributed to a deficiency of nitric oxide neurotransmitter in the brain. And what I tell all my uh, young scientists, uh, when I was teaching, I would tell my graduate students that, remember this, the brain has 10 times more nitric oxide than does any other organ in the body, and we don't wow. know why. So go after that problem. I mean, that's a good <laughs> problem to go after. That's amazing. So let's just kind of review, and then I want to get into the question everybody's thinking about, which is how do I get more of this stuff in my system? <laughs> so, so let's see, it, it dilates your blood vessels and lowers your blood pressure and improves blood flow in your organs. It prevents clotting, you mentioned, and it yes. prevents blockage in the arteries. It's an anti-inflammatory, so it helps keep the healthy arteries. It promotes learning, memory, and information recall. It helps regulate erectile function in men and rousing in women and other things, including affecting, protecting your skin from uh, the sun and, 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 and skin cancer. And you yes. also mentioned in your work that it, it promotes um, digestion by helping the movement of digested foods and regulating digestive enzymes and hormones. So it's, it's like incredible, it's an incredible molecule uh, that is doing all these things that no one even knew about until you came on the planet. <laughs> Isn't that something? I mean, it took, it, took, it took somebody to discover that nitric oxide, which had long been known to be a pollutant in the Earth's atmosphere, it took someone to show that our bodies could actually produce it. And once that was identified, everyone jumped on the bandwagon and so many different people discovered so many different effects of NO. Effects. But what's miraculous is that one single molecule can it, it exist ubiquitously throughout the body and produce all of these effects. And, you know, we've mentioned only half of them. So yeah. to me, as a scientist, I find that remarkable. But if you have a chemistry background, which I do, and you look at NO, it's perfectly suited for its job. Why, why have 25 different chemical molecules in the body, each doing something, when you can have one, nitric oxide. But it has to be regulated because, you know, you don't want to uh, increase blood flow to your legs uh, at the same time that you're creating a penile erection. You know, I mean, in, in one place it works, another place it doesn't. So it's highly regulated so that it's not working everywhere at the same time. It's incredible. So how do you know if you're low in nitric oxide? as a person walking around the street? Well, let me tell you something, sir. If I did not retire and I still had my laboratory, I would invite you to my laboratory to try to work out that problem. Because <laughs> <clears throat> no, it's such a difficult problem. It's impossible to measure nitric oxide real time because it's an unstable gas. It has a half-life of about two or three seconds. That's it. It, it, wow. as soon as it. As soon as it's made in the body, it works within a second or two, and then it's gone. And that's what you want from a signaling molecule. You know, you don't want the molecule to hang around forever. You just want it to hang around just for a little bit. But luckily, we're continuously making nitric oxide. If we have healthy arteries, they are continuously making nitric oxide. Unfortunately, we can't measure it. We can measure byproducts. In other words, we can measure nitrite, NO2 minus, and nitrate, NO3 minus, because NO is oxidized. That's how it's broken up. It's oxidized to nitrite and nitrate. So you can measure that. It's good in laboratory animals, but not in humans. Because, not great. Not great for going to your doctor and having it checked out. Well, I mean, because nitrites and nitrates are present in all the foods we eat. If you like beets and spinach and, and, and Brussels sprouts and you like to eat bacon and so on, all those foods are loaded with nitrite, nitrate. So you'll have a very, very high background level. And although it's been attempted, you cannot measure changes in nitric oxide production that way. But symptomatically, there's ways people can know, right? I mean. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, so what would I be mean, the kind of symptoms people might have? 
what we have tied, we meaning the scientific community, not, not, not I, but anyone with hypertension that's been examined clinically using invasive methods to measure NO, it's been shown that NO production by the arterial endothelial cells is diminished, okay? People who are obese have absolutely low levels of nitric oxide produced by endothelial cells. Sedentary mm. people who lead a sedentary lifestyle, the same. People have been subject, subjected to physical activity, just even minor physical activity, walking fast, riding a stationary bike. And there's ways to measure indirectly nitric oxide production. I can tell you about that in a second. And that NO goes up. And the way you measure NO indirectly is you put something like a blood pressure cuff on your finger and, and, and it, it's made tight. And then a, uh, the, the blood flow in your arm is stopped just for a, a few seconds. And then the, the, the tourniquet is released. That will cause blood flow uh, to go through the finger. And there's something called flow, blood flow dependent vasodilation. In other words, when you release that cuff and you allow the blood to flow through the hand, the blood flow because it creates a force against the arteries, that's called shear stress, that stimulates the arteries to make enormous amounts of nitric oxide. That's good because you wanna dilate all the blood vessels there that have just been constricted. So NO is released to dilate the blood vessels and allow blood flow. That's, that's what happens during exercise in all of your skeletal muscle, by the way. But you can measure that flow dependent vasodilation. And that's a pretty darn good measure of your capacity to make nitric oxide. So if you run that test, which is expensive, you usually have to go to a clinic, uh, whatever, uh, for now anyway, uh, you can determine how much NO you can make. And what we know is that people who lead an unhealthy lifestyle, if I just leave it at that, make substantially less nitric oxide. That's been borne out every time. That's amazing. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Hyman. Thanks for tuning into The Doctor's Pharmacy. I hope you're loving this podcast. It's one of my favorite things to do and introducing you all the experts that I know and I love and that I've learned so much from. And I wanna tell you about something else I'm doing, which is called Mark's Picks. It's my weekly newsletter. And in it, I share my favorite stuff from foods to supplements to gadgets to tools to enhance your health. It's all the cool stuff that I use and that my team uses to optimize and enhance our health. And I'd love you to sign up for the weekly newsletter. I'll only send it to you once a week on Fridays. Nothing else, I promise. And all you have to do is go to drhyman.com forward slash picks to sign up. That's drhyman.com forward slash picks, P-I-C-K-S, and sign up for the newsletter. And I'll share with you my favorite stuff that I use to enhance my health and get healthier and better and live younger longer. Now back to this week's episode. So everybody's listening and probably wondering, how do I boost my nitric oxide levels? And you talk and you work about a lot of things, uh, nutraceuticals, diet, protein, exercise, uh, breathing, the microbiome, all these things. So I wanna get into all this. So let's start with the conversation about diet and nutraceuticals okay. or okay. supplements and how they can affect uh, your nitric oxide production. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll make this as brief as I can. It's clear from the work so many people have done that a healthy balanced diet is the best way to maintain your adequate production and action of nitric oxide. And what do I mean by healthy diet? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and you know all about that. My goodness, that's been your career <laughs> and your pharmacy and everything else. I mean, we eat, have to eat healthy. What does healthy mean? Stay away from saturated fats. Look, I like a hamburger once in a while. Once every two months, I have a juicy, fatty hamburger. It's not going to kill me. It tastes good. I get it out of my system. But then I eat fish. Fish is my healthy protein. There are plant proteins, of course, that are healthy. But I stay away from uh, meats most of the time, even chicken. Hmm. I mean, chicken's okay. But as soon as you start eating the skin of the chicken, forget it. That's loaded with saturated fat. So I like eating fish for my healthy protein. And you do have to have, you know, healthy protein. But like many diets out there, which I, I don't want to talk about unless you do, I do not lower my carbs. 
uh, I'm a firm believer that you really, sh that 30% of your diet, you know, should be carbs, but healthy carbs, not potato chips, not packaged food. What do you, you know mean by healthy stuff? carbs? Oh, I mean the most colorful fruits and vegetables you can eat. Yes. The most powerful antioxidants. Remember, antioxidants can increase nitric oxide. Why? Because the antioxidants destroy the free radicals that go after nitric oxide to destroy the nitric oxide. So antioxidants will boost nitric oxide simply by stabilizing the molecule. We've done a lot of work on that, but most of it's been done by everybody else. But the darker the fruit, for example, the better the antioxidant. Pomegranate juice. Everybody knows pomegranate. If you ever get it on a white shirt, you can never get the stain off. That is a dark fruit. Same thing with blueberries, strawberries, any kind of berry. Let's go to the plant family, spinach. Popeye knew all about nitric oxide before anybody else did. I mean, spinach is very healthy. Uh, uh, kale, my goodness, kale, Brussels sprouts, uh, the dark green, you know, leafy vegetables. Uh, my wife and I have that every single day. I, you know, I just think that those carbs are so important because they're loaded with antioxidants. Yeah. But fats are also important. You need fats for energy, but unsaturated fat. I'm lucky I'm Italian because my parents <laughs> never used anything but olive oil. Olive oil. What I use. Olive oil. I use olive oil for, <laughs> I put it in everything except my coffee. Okay. And we use olive oil. And, and if you want to eat, you know, unsaturated fats from food, avocado is one of uh, many good examples. You just have to watch the calories. You know, whenever you're consuming any kind of fat, whether it's saturated or unsaturated, if your goal is to watch your weight, then, you know, just practice a little caloric restriction and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's my, I think, there's my uh, secrets I think, right there. I, I, I think I, I, I think you're eating lots of good fish and fruits and vegetables, and that's definitely a healthy diet. And you're cutting out the starch and sugars and the junk. A hundred percent agree. Oh, oh yeah, I, yeah. I think you know there is there is some question about you know the variations in the population, how some people can tolerate saturated fat better than others. Uh, and you know, Dr. Ronald Krauss uh, actually should have him on the podcast is one of the leading lipidologists. You might have heard of him or know yes, him. Yes, in fact. yes. And, you know, he's, he's challenged some of the orthodoxy about saturated fat. So I think there's, there's sure. still a debate about this, but I, I think you're right. I think there are, like, for example, for me, you know, I, 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 I'm uh, someone who genetically, I don't think I can tolerate a lot of saturated fat, whereas I've seen other patients do really well. So it's really like the N of one or personalized medicine on that. I 100% <laughs> right, agree. Right. So, so let's talk about the supplements you develop, because I'm really curious about what can we do? Because the other thing you talk about is protein, and, and we haven't really discussed it, but the the precursor or the building block of, of nitric oxide is an amino acid called arginine, which is found in a lot of foods, including almonds, is very high in arginine. Yes. Um, so, so tell me about uh, what we can do in terms of uh, the protein we should be eating, like the, the nitric oxide that, that, that's needed, uh, the arginine that's needed to get nitric oxide produced. What are the best sources of that? And then what are the supplements that you've been using to actually help boost nitric oxide levels? Sure. I... Uh... I think that uh, uh, after we discovered that our arteries can produce nitric oxide, another group actually discovered the enzyme, a group from Johns Hopkins discovered the enzyme that makes uh, nitric oxide, and that you refer to as nitric oxide synthase or NO synthase. And what they showed was that, like any other enzyme, a substrate is required, right, to be converted to product. So the substrate for enosynthase is arginine, one of the 20 or so basic amino acids that found in all protein. And so arginine is converted to nitric oxide uh, by this enzyme. And, you know, if you have an arginine deficiency, you're going to make less NO. If you have excess arginine, you'll be safe and you'll be able to make, you know, the normal amount of nitric oxide. Unless, of course, there are other underlying problems. You can make a lot of NO, but if you're not taking in sufficient antioxidants, if you are obese, especially morbidly obese, then you know you can take in all the arginine you want, and and you just your NO levels are not going to be uh, very high. So anyway, arginine is is a great 
amino acid. And, you know, this has come under some criticism. Some people, some scientists say that we have so much arginine in our body, it it saturates all the sites. So adding more is not going to increase NO. And I can tell you from our experiments and the experiments of hundreds of others that nothing could be further from the truth. You know, sometimes we don't understand something in science. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means we don't understand it. Right. So we will make more nitric oxide if you take in more arginine. That's been shown in, 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 in mice and rabbits with atherosclerosis. It's been shown in humans. A lot of great studies conducted in, in Germany. So it's good to, to consume arginine. Various ways you can do it. The richest source of arginine on a weight basis is, as you said, um, almonds. Actually, walnuts are good too. All nuts have arginine, uh, uh, almonds the most. Uh, There's a problem there because if you eat a cup of almonds, you'll make huge amounts of NO and you'll wind up with a 50 inch waistline in no time. I mean, it's extremely caloric. But if you eat fish, all protein has arginine. There's a lot of Mm -hmm, arginine mm -hmm. in protein. So you can, that's why I always say, uh, Mark, a healthy, balanced diet. You know, don't don't overdo this and overdo that and and, and eliminate this. You know, we're not, human beings were not designed for that. You know, no, but the diet we're eating is very different than your grandparents ate in Italy 100 years ago, right? <laughs> for sure. For sure. Well, what they ate was good because, uh, you know, my father, my father smoked camel cigarettes unfiltered for 70 years. He died at 96 years old without oh, a cough. Geez. Without a cough. Wow. Well, you know, I, that's good genetics right there. I, I, and my mom, same thing. My mom was overweight. She didn't smoke, but she oh, was overweight. She loved her cooking. You know, she died at 91. So I'm blessed. I probably don't even have to take care of myself and I'll live well. I'll be 80 years that's old a, in a few months. So, and, and I, and I, feel that's good. good. That's good. You, where UB Blake said, I, you know, I, I wish I'd known I was going to live so long. He lived to be over a hundred. He says, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, I love that. He smoked and drank. That. You know, yeah, I think you have to have the APOE double two gene to get that they might have the apoe double two and a bunch of other uh longevity genes which is uh, pretty awesome so good good for you um yes okay so what about just taking arginine what if i just go to the oh yeah store take take arginine is that it you can do you can do that uh what when the work was published by us uh and other groups um oh i guess in the in the early 90s uh, or late 90s i should say um it was clear that arginine was important. So many, many of the companies developed arginine supplements. And at the time they were very expensive. They put arginine, for example, in capsules and, and so on. And you have to be careful that way because arginine has a terrible, terrible taste. So either you're taking it in a capsule or many companies have made formulations of arginine mixed with you know, flavors, and other substance to make it more palatable so that you could, you know, take a couple of teaspoonfuls and, you know, make a solution and and drink it. And those products uh, have been extremely popular. I think there was a fellow, his name was Dr. Uh, John Cook. He was at Stanford uh, in 1998, and he developed something called the Heart Bar, which was a chocolate bar loaded with six thousand milligrams of arginine wow and i i was a good customer the only problem <laughs> was that the the the, the 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 uh the chocolate bars tasted god awful i mean you literally <laughs> had to close your nose when you ate them and eventually nobody would buy them and so you know that was the end that's of the very funny bar. and then we came up with i worked with the company we came up with or they did with a formulation that was really great and it's very good tasting. And I've been taking that since uh, July of 2003. My wife and now I- Now, is it a powder? powder? Is it a powder? It's a powder. <clears throat> it's a powder that consists of, a, of five grams. That's 5,000 milligrams wow. of arginine. It also has some citrulline, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And then it has, of course, vitamin C in it. And uh, newer formulations will probably contain 
uh, pomegranate instead because yeah. it's a much more powerful uh, antioxidant. Hmm. But, uh, and, and, and that's the way that works. When we marketed that uh, product, it's really funny, about a year later. I mean, What's it called? It's, it's called Nightworks, N-I-T-E-W-O-R-K-S. It's called Nightworks because um, at the time, we thought, scientists thought that uh, most heart attacks and strokes occurred in the evening hours. And mm. so even though we can't put claims on, on, the, on the bottle it, it, that it cures any disease or treats it or whatever, you can't say anything like that, of course, because of the yeah. FDA and uh, the Shea rules, uh, we just thought that, you know, we said, good for your heart health. That you're allowed to say, and it is. And we just thought, yeah. well, why not take it at night before you go to bed? But now we know mm -hmm. that it doesn't make any difference when you take it. As long as you take it, it doesn't make any difference. The levels of NO go up, they stay up. You could take it in the morning. I take it in the morning, every single morning. Even once a day is enough to keep it all day long? Yeah. Uh, yes, more, more or less, yes. I mean, mm. clinical studies have not been done. Those are very, very expensive to do. <clears throat> and a yeah. company, you know, I mean, didn't feel that but you've done necessary. animal studies looking if you give arginine to these animals their levels of nitric oxide increase yes yeah. and, and it's interesting in we still don't understand it completely if you give the arginine every day the the no synthase enzyme for some reason gets upregulated. so there's actually more enzyme maybe it's because the enzyme sees more substrate it thinks uh. we got to have more enzyme I, I don't know but anyway that means you get more no production and it stays up now, if you stop giving the arginine to the animals, it takes three to five days and it gradually goes down. So it, it's, it's very interesting. So Amazing. Does it, does it help lower blood pressure or would it help sexual function for people who take it? Okay. Well, no. Number one. I know you can't say anything. I have, to be, FDA, careful but, you know. what I, I have to be careful what I say. Because, <laughs> but just in uh, theory. In theory. You're, you're, you're very famous. Everybody listens to you, including the FDA. So we got to be careful what we say. And I'm, I'm still working for uh, this particular company, and I have to be very careful what I say. And also, you know, unless it's tested clinically in a double control, placebo control trial, which it's not, most supplements have not, you know, what supplement company has? Fifty million dollars to do a correct study, for God's sakes! You know nobody does. But yes, I can tell you because I gave this. I let people. You know, I gave this product to my mother, uh, to many people, my neighbors, in the gym, and so on. If you have hypertension, in many cases, this seemed to, you know, lower uh, the blood pressure. But I can't say that it was due to, due to the product. Could be a placebo effect. You know, we we have no evidence that this product in humans, you know, will lower the blood pressure. But the way I look at it is this. I look at the science. I'm a scientist, okay? I look at the science. This is a perfectly safe product. It makes all the sense in the world that if you give arginine, you're going to make more nitric oxide. Everyone knows that nitric oxide lowers the blood pressure. But I don't want to say that because that means everybody who buys the product is going to be telling everybody else to buy the product because it lowers the blood pressure. And we can't say that. I but understand. It's very heart healthy. That I can say. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. You have to do this if you are alive in the modern world and you want to live to a highly functional old age. And the reason I say this is that the safe EPA limits for lead used to be 20 parts per million. 